So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nanuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. 
ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at pulisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nanguli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan 
o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basehan ang isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS uh, webinar series. We trust that all of you are safe and in good health. I'm Sheila Sierra, and I will be your moderator. Our webinar today, uh, which we are holding in partnership with UNSCAP, focuses on regional integration, which is important for countries to overcome bottlenecks that impede the flow of goods, services, capital, people, and technologies. Today, we will discuss the Philippines' prospects, challenges, and opportunities 
for digital trade and digital health integration with the Asia Pacific and how we could possibly address the bottlenecks to move the regional integration agenda forward. To formally open our event, I now give the floor to the president of PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Ma'am Cel? Thank you, Sheila. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the presence of the following. National Economic and Development Authority Assistant Secretary for Policy and Planning Group, Carlos Bernardo Abad Santos. NEDA Assistant Secretary for Investment Programming Group, Roderick Planta. Development Academy of the Philippines President and CEO, Engelbert Caronan Jr. House of Representatives Congressional Planning and Budget Research Department, Executive Director, Novel Bangsal. Directors and officials from NEDA, CPBRD, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Department of Finance, Department of Foreign Affairs, Department of Information and Communications Technology, the AP National Council on Disability Affairs, Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines, and other government agencies who are with us this afternoon. Uh, from the private sector, we also have CU Doc founder and CEO Noel Del Castillo, Top Peg Animation and Creative Studio CEO Grace Gimaranan, Fund Nest President Nestor Lean, United Laboratory Senior Vice President Jose Maria Ochave, Ascend Vice President Jeffrey Gatdula, and um, Alchemy Education Solutions Director Maria Gladys Barrer. And from the academe, we have with us this afternoon Marinduque State College President Yosdado Zulueta, Cagayan State University Dean Julius Capilli, Southern Luzon State University Dean Catherine Cruz, University of Bohol Dean Amon Dennis Terol, Ateneo de Manila University Director Alvin Ang, De La Salle University Angelo King Institute Executive Director Teresa Tuliao, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Director Ricardo Ramiscal, UP Manila National Telehealth Center Director Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Cagayan State University Director Lirio Budina Mangawil, Northern Iloilo Polytechnic State College Batad Campus Associate Director Eva Montero, and University of Asia and the Pacific Program Director Jovi Dakanay. We also have with us this afternoon Deputy Permanent Delegate of the Philippines to UNESCO in Paris, Eileen Mendiola Rao, Australian Embassy in the Philippines Second Secretary Grace Castle Burns, Embassy of Mexico in the Philippines Head of Bilateral Cooperation and Economic Affairs Juan Gabriel Espejo Ceballos, Philippine Coalition in the UNCRPD President Ronel Del Rio, Phil Export Executive Assistant Vice President Maria Flor de Risa Leong, Institute for the Development of Educational and Ecological Alternatives Executive Director Roger Caringa, Philippine Association of Service Exporters Chairperson Edwina Beach, um, Philippine Software Industry Association Executive Director Ayn Ilya Inking, Simeo Inotech Director Ramon Bacani, APEC Business Advisory Council Director Antonio Basilio, IT and um, Business Process Association of the Philippines Executive Director Ricky Salvador, Masaganang Sakahan Director Daniel Agustin, and Samahan ng Kabataang Voluntario ng Pilipinas, Deputy Regional Director Albert Lee. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Good afternoon and welcome to our first webinar for this month. Over the years, we have seen the rise of digital technology globally. This did not only change the way people live and work, it also transformed how countries deal with each other, particularly in terms of trade. New technological developments paved the way for digital trade and digitally deliverable services that are able to reach consumers all over the world for as long as they are connected to the internet. To keep pace with these new developments, however, countries need to ensure that they are prepared for digital integration. This will ensure smooth transactions among their trading partners, as well as encourage digital growth and innovation for these countries. This afternoon, we will talk about the Philippines' readiness for digital integration. To be presented today is the PIDS study titled, How Ready Are We? Measuring the Philippines' Readiness for Digital Trade Integration with the Asia Pacific. Authored by PIDS Senior Research Fellow Francis Mark Kimba, PIDS Research Analyst Selwyn Calizo, 
Philippine Apex Study Center Network Project Evaluation Officer Jean Clarice Carlos and PIDS Senior Research Fellow Jose Ramon Albert. The study, commissioned by United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific or UNSCAP, assessed the Philippines' readiness for regional digital trade integration with the Asia Pacific by using the Regional Digital Trade Integration Index Framework to provide an analytical overview of the Philippines' digital trade policy and regulatory environment. The paper recognized e-commerce as an important economic growth driver in the country. The Philippine e-commerce roadmap, which was launched in 2016, emphasized that e-commerce enables domestic industries and enterprises to integrate into global value chains. Even micro, small, and medium enterprises which according to the Philippine Statistics Authority account for 99.5% of establishments in the country and employ 62.4% of the workforce will be able to participate in the global market. In addition, digital economy in the country continues to grow from 7.1 billion US dollars in 2019 to 7.5 billion US dollars in 2020. Another PIDS study authored by Dr. Albert in 2020 found that in 2019, Filipinos spent 310 million US dollars on online purchases. All this suggests that the Philippines could benefit from digital trade integration. However, challenges in the implementation of some digital trade policies still need to be addressed. We will know more about these issues from Dr. Kimba during his presentation. We will also hear the policy recommendations of Dr. Martina Ferracani, a Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute for a National Action Plan for the Philippines Digital Trade Integration in the Asia Pacific region. Another UNSCAP Commission study that will be presented this afternoon focuses on regional health integration in the Philippines. Among the members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, the Philippines is among those lagging in most critical health outcome indicators. But the establishment of the ASEAN Economic Community in 2015, which aimed to transform the region into a single market and production base, was seen to improve the socioeconomic structures of member states, including their health systems. How has this helped the Philippines in achieving its own health system goals? Later, PIDS Research Fellow Valerie Gilbert Ulep will present the findings of this study he co-authored with PIDS Research Analyst Lyle Daryl Casas. They found that health integration and cooperation could be instrumental in achieving health system goals. However, this could be hindered by the regulatory, infrastructure, and implementation challenges. To further understand the local perspective, we have invited trade and health experts from the government sector. This afternoon, we have with us Department of Trade and Industries Assistant Secretary and um, e-commerce lead, Mary Jean Pacheco, to share her insights on how the Philippines can advance digital trade and digital health integration with the Asia Pacific, as well as DTI's initiatives and programs to promote e-commerce and digital trade in goods and services. Meanwhile, Dr. Enrique Tayag from the Department of Health, who is also the chair of the ASEAN Technical Working Group on eHealth, will discuss how the Philippines can accelerate the adoption of digital health solutions and advance digital health integration with the Asia Pacific. We've also invited Dr. Yan Duval, Officer in Charge for Trade, Investment and Innovation Division and Chief for Trade Policy and Facilitation Section of the UNSCAP to discuss ways forward. I hope today's webinar will spark discussions on how we can improve our digital trade and digital health integration with the Asia Pacific, both of which are relevant to the developments and challenges we face nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mamsel. Uh, as you can see, we have a packed progr program uh, this afternoon. So without further ado, let us now proceed to the presentation. So. Um, the first paper, um, as mentioned by Mamsel, is on uh, uh, the Philippines readiness for digital trade integration and uh, flash on the screen are the authors. And to present the highlights of the paper are uh, Dr. Francis Kimba and Mr. Uh, Silwin um, Calizo. Okay. Um, Dr. Um, Kimba, Francis is, is a senior research fellow at PIDS and director of the Philippine Apex Study Center. Apex Study Center Network, or PASCN. 
Um, his research areas include trade and industrial development, innovation, and rural development. At present, he is interested in uh, studying the innovation activity of firms, and he, uh, Francis obtained his master's degree in international development from the International University of Japan and his second master's degree and PhD in, econo in development economics from the National uh, Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, Japan. Meanwhile, Silwin is a research specialist at PIDS. His research interests include international trade, uh, international, international trade policy issues such as non-tariff measures, trade liberalization and facilitation and the digital economy. He's also equally interested in the regional work of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. Selwyn has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Santo Tomas in the Philippines. Gentlemen, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sheila. Am I coming in loud and clear? Yes. So let me first acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Silwin, uh, who is presenting with me, as uh, Sheila has mentioned, Jean and uh, Dr. Albert. We are also very gr much grateful for the guidance and comments we obtained from Dr. Witada and Dr. Ferracani, who have guided us uh, in completing this work. Uh, this study assesses the Philippine readiness for regional digital trade integration with Asia Pacific by providing an analytical overview of the Philippine digital trade environment. And this report serves as a guide to crafting the Philippines National Action Plan, which we will also hear later for digital trade integration with Asia Pacific. So the main objectives of this study include utilizing the, digital, the regional digital trade integration index to measure the Philippines' readiness for integrating itself with the Asia Pacific and exploring the Philippines' involvement in international collaborations for digital trade integration. Finally, we will provide um, recommendations and policy for policy interventions in areas critical for regional and digital trade integration. So in the next slide, we want to hear about why regional trade uh, integration is worth studying. So in 2019, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, or UNCTAD, identified several key points about the digital economy for instance, they noted that the growing power of the digital platforms has global implications and that countries must be ready to create and to capture uh, digital value. As we have heard from Dr. Reyes's um, introductory remarks, the Philippines has three main um, characteristics, um, which are also the reasons to pursue better regional digital uh, trade integration. First is the importance of um, e-commerce, or as a component of digital trade in internationalizing the Philippine MSMEs. Second is the country's active digital economy, which we have heard um, as cited that uh, around the, the in 2020, the Philippines digital economy grew slightly from uh, $7.1 billion to $7.5 billion. And this is despite the pandemic. And the Philippines' strong position as a net exporter of digitally deliverable services, which amounts to around 3.6% of uh, GDP in 2019. And again, these are uh, key reasons enough to pursue better regional digital trade integration. But we also heard from Dr. Reyes that um, our world is now faced by new challenges coming from emerging issues about cross-border data flows and intellectual property and many other things. So in this new world where geographical barriers are rapidly fading, we must be able to understand how to collaborate with our neighbors in the region. But this collaboration requires countries to review and update their policies and regulations in order to make the digital economy work for the many and not just for the few. In a digital world, our domestic concerns are also regional concerns. And this is why it is important for us to study and understand the implications of regional digital trade integration for the Philippines. We also find it important to ask ourselves just how ready are we to integrate. In the next slide, let me just talk about the framework that we are using for this study. So measuring the Philippines' readiness for digital trade integration requires a specialized regional index. So in 2020, UNSCAP developed the Regional Digital Trade Integration Index, or RDTII, that captures regional integration perspectives specifically in the Asia-Pacific region. 
the RDPII understands that the digital trade integration is enabled by lower barriers for digital trade and higher levels of network openness, which is why the RDPII has 11 pillars exploring not just the traditional barriers, such as uh, Pillar 1, the tariff and trade defense, but also the presence of enablers affecting connectivity, such as cross-border data policies, Pillar 6, IPR, Pillar 4, and Infrastructure and Competition, Pillar 5. So each entry in the RDTII gets a score that goes from 0, which means not restricted, 0, and to 1, most restricted. And how did we utilize this? So we operationalized the RDTII by conducting a comprehensive review with the guidance of UNSCAP and um, Martina of primary texts and secondary reports from reliable institutions, such as the United States um, Trade Representative or the USTR, um, and, other, and other documents. So we looked at the executive documents, presidential decrees, executive orders, department orders or circulars, memorandum circulars, regulatory opinions, and also legislative documents, such as, of course, our constitution, republic acts, and even um, proposed uh, bills, House bills and Senate bills. We also looked at Supreme Court rulings and also secondary reports. In addition, um, we also conducted a number of uh, workshops designed to validate and to verify the accuracy of our uh, study assessment. The workshops in invited representatives from both the private and the public sectors, particularly for the foreign private sector, we in, including um, chambers of commerce and industry and multinational companies. For the domestic private sector, we invited um, industry associations, business groups, and industry specialists. And for the public sector, we invited the um, key departments and attached agencies, representatives from Congress, and independent government bodies. So the consultation workshops were conducted in April of this year, and around 29 institutions and offices representing a um, number of um, uh, were represented. So the consultation, um, the results of the consultation are actually available in the paper as an, an appendix. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so in this slide, let me now call my um, ABLE uh, partner. So Silvin, please take over. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So what you're seeing right now is an overall assessment of the Philippines. And I want you to look at table one first because this would show you the individual scores per pillar together with the remarks on its restrictiveness. Now, I, don't, I won't be going over all these scores for now because later on I'll be presenting our insights based on this assessment. But what I want you to know is that the Philippines has three non-restrictive pillars, which is a good thing, but it also has three strongly restricted pillars, which can be quite challenging. Now, another point is that the Philippines has an overall score of 0 0.342, which we can interpret as slightly restrictive. Now, we can also interpret this as the Philippines having a relatively open digital trade environment in 2020. But how does this score compare with the rest of the Asia Pacific? Figure 1 will show you that the Philippines has actually performed better than the regional average of 0 0.42. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll be presenting a total of seven insights, and I'll be starting with the more positive messages before I go with the more challenging ones. So the first insight test is that the Philippines has an exceptionally low tariffs on digital goods, and this synergizes well with having only slightly restrictive NTMs. Now, figure 2A would show you the effectively applied tariff rates, which has been reducing since 2015. And figure 2B would show you the coverage rate of duty-free digital goods imported from the Asia Pacific, which has been increasing since 2015. Now, what does figure 2 tells us? It tells us that the importation of digital goods remains unhampered insofar as tariffs are concerned. But there are some issues related to NTMs. And two things. First is that the trade of dual-use strategic goods are highly regulated. Now, these strategic goods can include computers, electronics, and telecoms that meet a certain technical standard that would make it fit for both military and civilian use. Now, we do acknowledge that 
the strategic trade control is something being practiced internationally. And we also recognize that the Strategic Management Office implements policies that are consistent with international best practices. However, we still con continue to include this measure because it, it can increase trade costs, thereby making trade more restrictive. The second issue is that there is a lack of self-certification for product safety, but I won't go over that too much anymore. Next slide, please. Okay, so our second insight is that there has been a continuous improvement on IPR enforcement, and this complements the Philippines' already liberal access to online content. Now, figure three would show you that intellectual property protection in ASEAN has been increasing, and that includes the Philippines as well. But there are still some issues related to this. Two things. Digital piracy remains high in the Philippines. In fact, in 2017, this was estimated at 64%. And this can be quite alarming because having a high digital piracy rate can make the Philippines more vulnerable to cyber attacks. And when you're more vulnerable to cyber attacks, you tend to become less safe, less trustworthy, and this can scare off foreign investors from entering the market. The second issue is related to content-specific safe harbor clauses. Now, safe harbor clauses are important because this allows online intermediaries to provide a wide range of services without the fear of incurring legal liability whenever a user conducts something illegal using their platform. Now, in the Philippines, there are two safe harbor clauses, which we can find from the Electronic Commerce Act and the Cybercrime Prevention Act. Now, these two clauses are content-specific, though, where, where the former is applied on electronic good uh, documents, while the latter is applied on cybercrimes defined under the law. Next slide, please. Okay, our third insight is that the Philippines has strong policies on data. Figure four will show you the business to consumer use in the ASEAN, and this, and this has also been increasing in the past few years. This suggests to us that Philippine businesses are able to comply with data policies, but at the same time still continue to grow. But what's the possible issue from arising from data policies? Well, there are trade costs that could arise from data retention and data privacy compliance. And this could possibly be felt more than by MSMEs than large firms because MSMEs have less resources to, to use for complying to these policies. Now, I, I added some examples here, but I won't be going through them in detail. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're starting with the more challenging messages now. The fourth insight is that foreign equity limitations can possibly ban foreign equity on some e-commerce and irritating, therefore restricting digital trade from growing. Now, what's the issue? Uh, we all know that mass media activity uh, cannot have foreign equity, but the problem is that the definition of mass media activity is found in different legislations and uh, regulatory opinions. Therefore, there's no single definition of what constitutes mass media activity. Now, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, issued a, an opinion in 2018 which provided some guidelines on how they would determine whether a business activity would be considered as mass media or whether it would be considered as advertising. And the, the, the possibly worrisome part here is that the SEC does this determination through a case-by-case -case approach. And doing this kind of approach can make an environment that is uncertain. And when an environment is uncertain, this can scare off or discourage foreign investors from entering the market. Next slide, please. Okay, so our fifth assessment is that highly discouraging policies affect foreign bidders' participation to public procurement. Now, there are two groups here, consultants and bidders, but I would be focusing more on the bidders part. Now, foreign bidders face a 15% domestic price preference. Now, this is okay because, of course, we want to support our domestic economy, but this domestic preference could become problematic if it can create inefficiencies. So, for instance, there were cases where local bidders were awarded a project, but they were they do not have the capacity to fulfill that project 
Therefore, these local bidders end up subcontracting a foreign supplier which could have been awarded the project in the first place. Now, the second issue has to do with the local reference requirement. Now, a local reference is required from foreign bidders who want to participate in infrastructure projects. But the problem with but this create can create a problem in the digital economy because digital infrastructure can be quite new. Therefore, it would have been impossible for these foreign bidders to present a local reference to begin with. And since they cannot present a local reference, they're effectively prevented from participating in this infrastructure public uh, projects, public procurement. Now, the third issue has to do with foreign equity limitations, but I won't go over that anymore. Next slide, please. Okay, our sixth insight is that there are strong barriers to entry restricting the Philippine telecommunications sector. Now, figure five will show you the infrastructure performance in the ASEAN 5, but I want you to focus in the Philippines. Notice that the Philippines has been relatively stable throughout this time period, which suggests to us that there has been no significant improvement in how infrastructure is being developed in the country. And this infrastructure also includes the telecommunications sector. Now, what are the possible issues? Four things. First, it could be because of the lack of local loop unbundling, which can prevent healthy competition. Second, it could be because of foreign equity limitations to public utilities, which caps foreign equity to just 40%. But I think the most restrictive ones are coming from the bottom two, which are the legislative franchise from Congress and strict licensing requirements, such as the CPCN. Now, these two can take up several years, and since they take up so many years, it can be both time-consuming and expensive. Next slide, please. Okay, so our last insight has to do with the infrastructure gap on both ICT and transportation, and this can adversely affect online sales and transactions. Earlier, I already showed you figure five about the general condition of infrastructure, but I want to add here figure six, which shows you the cell tower density in ASEAN, and you see that the Philippines has 70 towers per 1,000 square kilometers, and this lags behind Thailand's 92.5 and Vietnam's 166 towers. Another point is that this probably affects e-commerce more because even though transactions occur electronically or digitally, the goods remain to be physical. And since these goods are physical, they need to go through logistics services in order to arrive to the consumer. And a good logistics service depends on a good and reliable transportation infrastructure. So this infrastructure gap can, can adversely affect online sales and transactions. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll be giving the main takeaway. Uh, earlier, I already uh, showed you that the Philippines has performed better than the Asia Pacific, and we've also shown you the strengths and weaknesses of the Philippines. But despite all these weaknesses, we do believe that the Philippines is ready for regional digital trade integration with the Asia Pacific. However, we do note that uh, the, the Philippine government uh, needs to improve on the implementation of certain policies and create or amend uh, laws that would be enable it to address emerging issues in the in the digital economy. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll return the floor to Sir Francis since he will be presenting this slide for us. Thank you. All right. So just a very quick um, summary of ways forward and policy recommendations after hearing the issues. We just want to mention that there are two main um, branches of policy recommendations to address the remaining issues for digital trade integration. The first one would be the low hanging fruits because these are the ones that could be easily achieved without uh, uh, through executive um, uh, policies. Uh, for instance, the continuing uh, Philippine participation in international cooperation initiatives such as the ITA1, ITA2 and the joint uh, statement initiative uh, reducing digital piracy by strengthening digital enforcement capacity and the removing the removal of the case-by-case -case determination of mass media. Another would be the quant quantifying the cost of policies restricting foreign equity participation in telecommunications and electronic commerce, and this would involve um, uh, heavy research. Another branch would be the whole of government, and this would involve coordination of branches of government. For example, this would include the um, removing the limits to the in the constitution 
and the passing of bills currently being discussed, such as the e-government bill or HB uh, 1248, and in addition, amending old ones, such as the Government Procurement Act. So um, we will hear uh, additional policy recommendations from the National Action Plan, which will be presented late, um, after this by uh, Dr. Farrakhani. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. We will hear about um, Dr. Farrakhani's um, action plan um, after uh, we have um, after the uh, presentation on digi digital health by uh, Val. Okay, so friends uh, from Digital Trade, let us jump to digital health and flash on the screen are the authors of uh, the paper, uh, Regional Health Integration and Cooperation in the Philippines, uh, Dr. Uh, Valerie Gilbert Ulep and Mr. Lyle Daryl Cassis, both from PIDS. And to present the paper is uh, Dr. Val Ulep, a research fellow at PIDS, whose research areas include health financing, health service delivery, and nutrition. And prior to joining uh, PIDS, Val worked at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. and Delhi. And he was uh, part of a team that provided analytical products for India, Maldives, Bhutan, Croatia, and Afghanistan on nutrition and universal health uh, coverage. He was a doctoral fellow at the University of Toronto Center for Global Health Research. And he holds a PhD in health economics from Canada and a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of the Philippines. Val, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Mom Sheila. Um, okay. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. So the title of my presentation is Regional Health Integration and Cooperation in the Philippines. So I authored this paper with Lyle, Mr. Lyle Casas, and this project was funded by UNESCO. So next slide, please. So there are three objectives of, of the paper or, or the presentation. So number one is to assess uh, the performance of the Philippine health system vis-a-vis -vis the ASEAN or our regional uh, neighbors. Second is to assess regional health integration and cooperation in the Philippines. And third is to identify areas in which um, health integration and cooperation uh, can be obtained. So next slide, please. So I just want to uh, describe first the framework of the study that we use. So the goal of any health system, as we know, is to basically improve your health outcomes, right, or your, your well-being. And health outcomes are largely driven by the ability of the population to access healthcare services, right? And the ability of people to access healthcare services is, um, is a function uh, of your health system, right? So the following are the building blocks of the health system. So there's your health human resources, uh, there is your health facilities or your health service delivery system, uh, your financing, health financing systems, um, your your e-health system, etc. And and the entry point of economic integration is actually affecting all these health system health system building blocks. So next slide, please. So let's start first um, with health outcomes because this is like the main outcomes that every health system should actually focus on, right? So Filipinos in general uh, are becoming healthier in recent decades, right? So if you look at infant mortality, it's one of the sensitive measure of population health, has improved in the last two to three decades. However, if you look at that improvement, infant mortality remains to be high, right? Uh, if you compare it to other ASEAN countries. Um, so um, IMR is still relatively high compared to our uh, um, our neighbors. So the slow improvement in health outcomes um, uh, failed the country uh, from achieving many development targets in our SDGs. And if you don't, if you do not make any um, path-breaking interventions, we might fail again for the SDGs. So next slide, please. So um, to improve health outcomes, access to essential, high-quality um, healthcare services is very important or very critical, right? access to essential healthcare services remains to be a challenge um, or a problem in the Philippines. So if you look at the UHC, uh, UHC service coverage index, which is an indi uh, which is an SDG indicator to measure uh, the country's progress towards UHC, 
um, the country is lagging behind in terms of providing access to essential healthcare services like for maternal and child health services, for infectious disease um, services, and for NCD services. Right? You will see that the Philippines is actually lagging um, in providing these very essential uh, healthcare services. Next slide, please. So let's start uh, the first pillar, which is health facilities or health service delivery, right? So um, these are just snippets of some of the findings, uh, and we'll not go through them, but if you want to read the whole uh, analysis, uh, you can actually just download the paper. Right? So health system must have adequate number of health facilities, right, or number of beds offering different types of, you know, health, uh, different types of health services, right? But however, the Philippines is actually uh, experiencing large scarcity of these types of health facilities, right? So for example, based on our GS analysis with uh, the Department of Health, about half of Filipinos do not have timely access to primary care health facilities such as rural health units or barangay health station. And if you look at uh, the of beds, right, the availability of bed is also um, is, is, is very limited. So we have only one bed per 1,000 population which is actually comparable to a lot of sub-Saharan African countries or many low-income countries, right? So according to the Department of Health, um, the country needs additional 400,000 hospital beds to meet the population need uh, for, for inpatient care. So that translates around 2.7 beds per 1,000 population, right? So no wonder that we, uh, during COVID, we are experiencing a lot of uh, problems with, with uh, inpatient care, right? Next slide, please. So another important aspect of, of, of the health system is your health human resources. So here the figure shows the availability of physicians compared to other ASEAN countries and, and the stock of physician is relatively low. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the density of, uh, of physician is relatively low if you compare it to, ASEAN, to our ASEAN neighbor. Um, and if you look at our report, we, we 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 tried to tease this out and provide more understanding about this scarcity. So we've um, discussed issues on maldistribution across provinces and across uh, uh, local governments um, and uh, across socioeconomic status. So um, in our analysis in the report, most of health work workers are situated in urban areas. So. For example, in the latest health facility survey of the Department of Health, like only 90% of rural health units or your primary care health facilities in the country have at least one medical doctor. And if you look at standards, like all rural health units or primary care health facilities should have, uh, should have um, uh, a physician. Right? So next slide, please. Another important pillar is health financing. So when you say health financing, it examines the country's level of health spending, um, including the type of sources. So it's not only the level of health spending, but also um, um, the source, right? So, so if, you, if you try to analyze the out of pocket, uh, if you try to examine the total health spending, more than half of um, the country's um, health spending um, is accounted for out of pocket. And out of pocket remains a major source of um, 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 health spending so public spending or the government spending um in the philippines is one of the lowest in the asian region so for example in two, in 2018 public spending on health was around 50 dollars so this is com considered low um for a middle income country like for example thailand and malaysia th these two countries are lauded for their you know um, um, um comprehensive uhc uh programs, they're spending around $100, $150 per, day, uh, per, per capita. So the country's public spending on health was around 1.5% of GDP, which is significantly lower than Thailand, for example, or Vietnam or Malaysia, where they spend around like 4% to 5% of their health spending. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the paper, there is also a, a, a a lengthy discussion about um, the preparedness um, of of the country uh, uh, to disaster. So, as you may know, the Philippines recorded uh, the greatest number of uh, disasters in the region, right? So, around 34% of the recorded disaster in the region 
um, um, occurred in the Philippines. So hydrological and meteorological types of disasters are the most common uh, in the Philippines. Um, so preparedness during public health emergencies varies across ASEAN members, right? Um, uh, so we try to measure the preparedness or we try to understand the preparedness of the Philippines relative to our neighbors. So we look at the international health regulations, for example, of the WHO, um, uh, which monitors the capabilities of health system to detect, assess, and notify uh, public health risk and emergency of national and international concern, including, for example, pandemics or um, et cetera. So the, I, the, the IHR identified 13 core capabilities that countries need to, to be monitored. So in, in, in 2019, the Philippines only received an average score of 53% uh, percent in IHR, one of the poorest performing countries uh, next to Laos and Cambodia. Next slide. So um, the assessment of the health sector, um, um, there are more uh, in-depth analysis on the uh, on, on the assessment of performance, but I will not go through them. Uh, you can, as, as I said, you can download the paper and read the details, but I just want to provide a summary, right? So in summary, um, the country's relatively uh, poor performance in improving health outcomes is, is a manifestation of the different health system challenges um, which reinforces, again, I said, the need to implement uh, major health reforms in addressing limited health facilities, health workers, and health financing inefficiency. So, um, and ASEAN member states recognize the importance of, of resilient and effective health systems. So um, if you look at most ASEAN states that have recognized and embraced um, universal health coverage as an important component of, of, of their political agenda. So the goal of universal health coverage is included in many I think we lost uh, Val. Hello, Val. Yeah, I think we lost Val. We lost Val. Okay. Um, something to do with his audio, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if he can hear us now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Val, we lost you. Now you're back. Can you hear me? Val? Uh, Val, we can, can, can you try your audio, please? Hello, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, we can okay. hear you now. We lost oh. you for a while. Go okay. ahead. So, so, okay, so I'll just make a brief summary, right? So, um, so in summary, the country's relatively poor performance in improving um, health outcome is a manifestation of the different health system challenges, um, which again, reinforces the need to implement health reforms in addressing limited health facilities, um, 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 limited health workers, and um, health financing inefficiencies, right? So as I've said, like ASEAN member states recognize the importance of resilient and efficient health systems. So most Member states, including the Philippines, have embraced universal health coverage as an important component of the country's political agenda. So, so the goal of UHC is, is included in many regional and international um, 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 goals, um, including the SDGs and the post-2015 ASEAN Health Agenda. So next slide, please. So in the second part of my presentation, we examine uh, the intersection of economic integration and cooperation and the pursuit of UHC in the Philippines. So as we, as we know, there is a growing multilateral collaboration among ASEAN member states 
which has led to the creation of the ASEAN Economic Community in 2015, which aims to facilitate trade and create single market and production base integrated into the global economy, right? So the push for economic integration and the region uh, can argue, like arguably, um, the, the, the push for economic integration in the region has profound impact on economic and social structures of countries, including, um, uh, including health systems. So it is therefore important to find the common ground between economic integration and cooperation with the overall, overall health goals of the health system. So as I've said, in, as I've said a while ago during the first part of the pre presentation, in identifying, um, in, in, in finding this nexus, we've used this framework, um, um, the health system framework that's commonly used by WHO. So in identifying the barriers in trade in health services and goods, we obtained, um, we obtained it from key informant interviews and review from different documents of government, um, 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 such as the Department of Health, Field Health, etc. So next slide, please. So just a brief background about trade in services and go goods related to health. So the World Trade Organization classifies trade in services into four modes and try to relate that to health services, right? So the first one is cross-border movement of health transactions, right? So an example of that is uh, telemedicine or healthcare related BPO like um, medical transcriptionists. Um, the second mode is the consumption of health services outside your country, right? An example of this is medical tourism or medical education. Um, the third is uh, the third mode is commercial presence. An example to this is uh, foreign direct investments in hospitals or manufacturing and distribution of medical goods and products. Um, the fourth one is movement of health workers, like mobility of health workers um, 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 for training or for employment. Um, and of course, outside of this mode is the free trades of good and products such as medicine, medical equipment, devices, etc. Right. So in this paper, we've tried to elaborate, elaborate each and every mode. So we've identified the barriers of each. So next slide, please. Um, however, it's important to link again these modes with the general goals of health system, right? So which is to improve, as I've said, health access and health outcomes, right? So for example, um, the profound impact of trade in medical goods and pharmaceutical product um, of openness to trade would, is to facilitate access to essential healthcare uh, goods and, and healthcare, sorry, um, access to essential, you know, um, healthcare goods such as medicine or devices, right? At competitive prices. For, tel uh, for telemedicine or cross-border movement of services, um, the idea here is to improve access to essential and specialized diagnostic care and services, right? So telemedicine should facilitate access to essential and specialized diagnostic care. For, for medical tourism, so the possible positive impact of that is um, it provides economic benefits, including additional resources for health investments. For FDI or foreign direct investments for health, a commercial presence um, of health facilities, for example, could generate resources for expanding and upgrading healthcare infrastructure and technologies. And the last one for the mode four, so the positive impact of that is uh, mobility of healthcare worker should contribute um, to the efficiency and uh, uh, product, I mean, uh, contributes to the efficient and productive use of health labor force and facility transfer of technical expertise and knowledge. So next slide, please. So majority, uh, so, so, so let's start with uh, trade in medical goods and products. So how does trade affects access to healthcare services? So the most obvious linkage in, in the, cons uh, the, the most um, obvious linkage of trade in uh, goods and trade in goods and, and in, in, in achieving health outcomes is actually uh, on the consumption side. So openness to trade could facilitate access to essential healthcare goods and providers uh, uh, at a competitive price, right? So here you would see, um, we, we tried to look at the, um, the level of, of, of trade of medical goods uh, um, 
in the Philippines uh, vis a vis with, with, our, with, with our other countries like. So majority of the Philippine imports of medical related products come from the ASEAN region while most of its exports go to other countries. For example, in 2019, value of imports from ASEAN to Philippines was around 1.3 billion. And this, is, um, and this is the highest compared to other regions, right? So next slide, please. Um, I'll just skip this. This is just basically a time series of the imp uh, imported health, go uh, imp imported and exported health commodities in the Philippines, right? So next slide. So what are the implications to trade here? Right? So, so here, uh, tariff and non-tariff measures restrict um, trade in medical goods and products. So, so if you look at the average tariff of health products was rather low in the Philippines. So this is actually very good, right? So the Philippines um, um, also is part of the ASEAN Trade in, in, in Goods Agreement or the ATIGA in which ASEAN member state commits to reduce tariff of almost uh, zero to five percent for for most products, right? So, so in in March 2020, under the Bayanihan Act or the Republic Act um, number 11469, the Philippine government exempted the importation of certain medical goods and supplies from all duties, taxes, and fees for three months. So, so these are some of the interventions during uh, during COVID um, to actually um, improve access to essential um, supplies and, uh, and goods uh, during the pandemic. So, so, so here what I'm discussing here are some of the tariff measures, but there are also other um, non-tariff measures or non-tariff bar barriers that actually restrict trade, right? So I think a lot of my paid co colleagues have examined this, so you may want to check uh, on these studies on the non-trade barriers, and I think they've examined um, 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 uh, uh, they examined um, the, the health sector. Okay, next slide, please. So um, another um, an another example of cross-border supply, so we're not going to services. So another example is the cross-border supply of services. So again, this is mode one. So an example to this is outsourcing of medical transcription, uh, uh, outsourcing of, of, of services like uh, such as medical transcription um, uh, services. I won't delve too much on this, um, but we recognize the, the growing industry and how the, the industry improves social welfare by increasing income and employment. But I will not go through through. I will not. I will not discuss this in detail. So next slide, please. So another important type of cross border uh, uh, cross border movement of services is telemedicine. So we're still in mode one. So what is telemedicine, right? So, so the WHO defined uh, telemedicine as the delivery of healthcare services where healthcare provider is distant uh, with the patient and information and communication technology is used to delve, deliver um, or exchange of information needed for diagnosis or treatment or disease prevention, monitoring and evaluation, et cetera, right, of, of your condition. So. So telemedicine, if you if you try to dissect this definition, have different classification and forms. So for each classification of telemedicine, um, different um, services can be done. So the most common form is teleconsultation, where a patient sees healthcare consultation through various modes such as video conferencing, mobile messaging apps through the use of internet, and typically, the payment uh, will also be done through online, right? Through various uh, payment modes or channels. So. so, next slide, please. So, in the Philippines, uh, the current state of telemedicine is still in the early stages, right? So, um, the practice and conduct of medicine is not telemedicine in the Philippines is not like uh, it's not yet highly institutionalized, um, despite. Um, many initiatives over the past uh, i would say the past decade so but again i think efforts were accelerated due to covid 19 pandemic i think that many of us uh, um, were forced to actually adopt telemedicine um, because of restrictions of mobility cross-border travel and the over overwhelmed healthcare system um, in fact um, the department of health or PhilHealth has temporarily um, uh, release guidelines, uh, clinical practice guidelines uh, on the use of telemedicine um, in response to COVID-19. Right. Next slide, please. 
So these are some of the barriers. Um, when we talk about cross-border telemedicine, we need to think about the general climate of telemedicine in the country. So here are some of the um, issues that we've identified during uh, our review and, and, and key informant uh, interviews, right? So number one is the lack of regulatory framework, right? So the only government document, if you try to scan um, the, 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 the policies, right? The only government document before the pandemic related to e-health in the Philippines was the the Philippine e-health strategic framework. But this one, I, I would say is very broad. Uh, I would say it's very aspirational uh, document. And a lot of the operational issues remain to be very vague, right? So the document examine both the front end or the use of e-health, like such as telemedicine and the back end, such as infrastructure facilities, such as uh, such as the use of, of electronic medical records. Um, so, as I've said, these are very aspirational and a lot of operational uh, issues uh, have yet to be identified, right? So, um, in 2020, a, a temporary guidelines set by the DOH, FDAs, and other medical societies um, were able to come up with a more detailed operational uh, de uh, guidelines, and, that's, and this is primarily driven by the COVID-19, right? So, number one is the lack of regulatory framework. Another is actually an issue is the ambiguity of existing laws, right? So most of the regulations are interpreted to apply to the practice of healthcare providers, like um, um, physician and pharmacists. So for example, um, if you look at the Pharmacy Act, it recognizes telepharmacy um, and allows services of a duly licensed pharmacist to be done online as long as there, there is a licensed uh, physical, uh, physical uh, pharmacy, right? However, if you look at the medical act that is for a physician, the practice of medicine is engaged only if the professional is physically examining the person. So there is um, ambiguity again in, the, in existing uh, existing law. So um, um, as a, uh, another important um, issue under this is the uh, foreign, for example, foreign uh, physicians or medical, foreign medical uh, workers cannot practice in the Philippines, right? So any physician in the country with valid license can actually practice telemedicine. However, due to lack of national legislation specific to practice of foreign licensed physician, for example, only Filipino licensed physician can practice telemedicine to the patient residing in the Philippines, right? Uh, uh, another important issue is financing. So even if you have telemedicine, but there is no financing mechanism, I think PhilHealth is starting to cover. Um, there is discussion about covering um, telemedicine, but in the past there is no um, specific law or um, policies on how do we finance um, 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 telemedicine. So um, another one, another issue is limitation in infrastructure, such as untrained staff, high financial requirement of telemedicine, lack of ICT infrastructure, and high speed internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are um, issues that are keep recurring in many interviews. So, so, so again, um, these things are have large repercussions on the quality of care. So, um, another important thing is that the medical education is not attuned to to electronic um, interactions um, during patient um, uh, provider inter, uh, uh, interface. N next slide, please. So let, now let's go to mode two, or consumption of health services abroad or medical tourism. So um, just, just to give you a brief uh, background um, um, about, or numbers about medical tourism. So in 2019, around 10,000 tourists visited the Philippines. If you look at the data from the, the, Department, of, um, um, the Department of Tourism, around 5% of that um, are accounted from ASEAN neighbors. So however, if you look at other data, like for example, from uh, Oscar Picasso, um, uh, PIDS have received approximately out around 80,000 um, uh, medical tourists in 2010. So there is actually large discrepancy, maybe because like we are not actually monitoring uh, medical tourists coming from the Philippines. So, so that's actually one of the major challenge if you if you if, uh, during key informant interview the lack of the lack of data, right? So in the Philippines, medical tourism um, revolves around. 10 hospitals uh, accredited uh, by the Department of Tourism um, um, and three private hospitals accredited by an international accreditation body. So most of the medical tourists are actually uh, going into these facilities. So it revolves around these facilities. Next slide, please. So, um, 
So some of the barriers that we've no identified um, uh, during key informant interviews and reviews, so number one is inequity concerns. A lot of uh, decision makers um, are voicing their concerns on um, um, issues of inequity, that um, um, medical tourism that might lead to inequity. So um, a lot of decision makers perceive medical tourism tourism to have negative and negative effects because it might lead to brain drain in public hospital systems. It also creates dual health systems, so it leads to more inefficient health system. Some have voiced out issues on medical inflation, and it can be highly regressive because of the lack of portability of health insurance, right? So um, another issue is regulatory ambiguity and limited capacity. So for example, there is no clear delineations of the Department of Health or the Department of Tourism which should, uh, I mean, we, we need to clearly identify the, the the roles of these both of these two agencies, right? And I've said there's also limited capacity. For example, in the Department of Health, like a small technical office um, in DUH handles medical tourism, um, but a stronger technical capacity is needed to set, for example, framework, directions, and standards of the industry um, is actually needed. So, um, yeah, so that's a, a very important issue that keep keeps coming in interviews on, 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 on the capacity of, of, of many uh, government bureaucracy, right? Um, and the last um, uh, barrier is the lack of the data to measure the scale of medical tourism. So the Philippines doesn't have um, a repository, like a, a, a reliable rep rep repository of medical tourism, unlike in medical, unlike in other countries in the region, like uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore, right? Next slide, please. Okay, um, so now let's go to mode three or commercial presence. So these, again, uh, mode three is commercial presence or foreign direct investments. So um, in 2019, human health activities only accounts for like less than 1% of total foreign investment. So, I mean, um, FDI related to health is very, very low in the Philippines around 1%. So in 2019, total in, Total in 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 2019, 10% of investments in the health sector are foreign in origin, and 90% are domestic. Right. Um, however, due to pandemic, um, um, domestic and foreign investments in human health have sharply declined. Right. So, um, investment in health sector declined from around three billion pesos in 2019 to around a 2.5 million in 2020. So, a 21% decline. Um, um, uh, uh, 21 uh, percent decline right? next next slide um i think it's also important to um in the paper we've also tried to um include some of the lessons learned um on foreign direct investments in other countries and in the philippines so there are actually lessons learned that we can actually you know um, um assimilate so there are preceded both a national and international experience in the use of fdi to improve um access right so um, number one is the expansion of hospital services um, is one of the areas that in which FDI could directly affect the provision of healthcare services. An example to this is um, Asian hospitals and um, and, um, and international um, 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 uh, corporation um, um, investing in, lo in domestic um, hospitals. Like um, I, I think there are also experiences, for example, in Metro Pacific hospitals. Um, um, the owners of Makati Med, etc. Um, they have we have, have lessons to learn um, in 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 attracting foreign direct investment. So there are also nice experiences in Thailand, in India, in accepting um, foreign direct investments in hospital to improve um, access. Right. Um, so next slide, please. These are some some of the barriers under mode three right uh, that we've identified so number one is foreign ownership restriction which is actually a major challenge in promoting uh foreign investments particularly in the hospital sector so foreign ownership in, in health faci facilities is limited only to a maximum of 40 percent of the equity capital right um but there is actually 100 percent equity capital in special uh, uh economic zone registered medical tourism right um, and for manufacturing, 100% equity capital uh, for distribution and manufacturing of medical goods such as drugs and devices. But I think one of the most uh, critical thing here is the, the some of the restrictions in 
in in ownership for health facilities, which is only 40%. So, so that's one of the barriers that we've identified. Second is inequity concerns leading to poor uh, political and uh, advocacy support, right? So a lot of decision makers also think that um, foreign direct investments in hospitals could lead to um, um, inequities. Um, um, it can also lead to um, uh, uh, dual health systems, which is like uh, mostly a health efficient, clean scheming, and and more technology centric. It is more and more expensive. And the last barrier is bureaucratic issues and some issues related to doing business. It's it's actually a a, a, a very important barrier that keeps repeating in many interviews. So next slide, please. So here, um, um, I think we're now in mo mode four. Um, this is basically the mobility of health workers. So I think everyone knows this, the Philippines is recognized to be one of the highest export of, of workforce. Um, it, it's really hard to get data on, on um, the mobility of health workers within the region because of the lack of data. Um, in, in the ASEAN regions, we don't know um, how, how many health workers are going to Singapore, Malaysia, and how many health workers are coming to the country, et cetera. So I, I think what we, um, um, what we, we try to look at individual countries, for example, like Singapore, um, and I, I think most of their health workers, foreign health workers are Filipinos. So this is actually the data that we can actually find um, um, uh, uh, within the region. But other than that, we, can, we don't know the extent of mobility of health workers within the region. Right? Um, next slide. Uh, no, this is just a figure showing you that um, most, uh, showing that the Philippines um, is a major export of health workers uh, for both doctors and nurses. Next slide, please. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. So, so these are, um, um, in addition to mobility of health workers, I think one important component of this mode is uh, the mobility of, of training or, or, or training or skill set, right? So so there are existing mechanisms within the region to increase capacity and technical skills of health leaders through knowledge sharing platforms. So I think in the paper we've discussed some um, um, training uh, collaborations within the region, such as the Field Epidemiology Tra Training Network in ASEAN. There is also health technology assessment capacity. Um, 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 and there are also um, um, training capacity or uh, sharing of, of 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 skills with regards to the implementing implementation of UHC and health financing, Thailand and Singapore are typically providing um, best practices to other countries like the Philippines, etc. But some of these are are, are very loosely uh, conducted. But there are existing mechanisms um, in place in the region. Right. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the barriers under mode four. Um, mobility of health workers are commonly um, is um, um, or interregional mobility of health work workforce is very very negligible in in the ASEAN region because of so many concerns like inequity concerns, occupational protectionism, variable recognition of health profession professional across ASEAN state, a weak institutional capacity of many government agencies in the Philippines like. Um, BUH or PRC implementing MRAs, right? Um, and the lack of incentive to move, which is also a very important uh, barrier, it's like lack of social protection in, in, in the receiving country, language barrier, and cultural diversity. So these are all discussed in the paper. Uh, next slide, please. I'll try to be very quick. So some of the recommendations in the paper, I'll, I will not go through them, um, um, but number one, um, to strengthen implementation of digital health services and health governance structures domestically. First, then, you know, we strengthen it at the regional collaboration and digital health efforts, um, including digital trade. Second is to facilitate foreign direct investments um, in the hospital sector. Um, third is develop in a well-implemented um, and well-thought medical tourism program and to strengthen cross-border mobility of health human resources. Next slide, please. Um, we've... So we've identified some of, of the mechanism on how to do this, right? Um, for example, number one, strengthen implementation of digital health strategies and health governance structure. So number one, the e-health system and service bill should be supported by the Congress to support 
as the regulatory framework and institutionalist telemedicine domestically. Second is service delivery reform should be explored to facilitate integration and coordination of health facilities. Third is interoperability of EMRs domestically should be enabled. Health financing reforms for telemedicine should be facilit facilitated. Fifth is making telemedicine and electronic medical rec uh, um, EMR as a norm among healthcare providers, right? And six is to re is to revisit pri uh, privacy laws. Next, next slide, please. Um, these are some also specific some of the specific recommendations under FDI um, is to increase equity capital threshold for hospital foreign investments. Um, I think the Department of Health is now trying to um, explore these recommendations. Uh, number one, increase equity capital threshold for foreign investments, um, impose additional tax breaks for hospital investments, um, accelerate um, investment approvals. Fourth is implementation of genuine health financing reforms. So as I've said a while ago, these recommendations are currently being considered because the release of the health facility development plan They've realized that they need the private sector to actually fill the huge uh, infrastructure gap. So one of the mechanisms is to attract FDIs, and some of these um, recommendations are currently being explored if it will facilitate the the, the um, at, I mean facilitate attraction of foreign investments. Um, lastly, um, so development and, and implementation of a well thought medical tourism program. So number one is to update and amend regulations and framework for medical tourism. I think now we have we have yet to update our existing medical tourism stra strategy. Um, number two is similar to Thailand and Singapore, is to identify a niche in medical tourism, right? That complements actually UHC. For instance, um, 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 examining whether wellness center, aging and retirement home as a possible um, um, niche market for medical tourism. I think this one, this again is being currently explored in the Department of Health. The last one is to use tax revenues, for example, from medical tourism to finance the implementation of universal health coverage, right? So some of these are um, 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 some of the uh, policy actions that can be implemented to actually align um, the goals of UHC and the goals of economic integration. So oh, thank you very much uh, and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Val. That was quite extensive. Nevertheless, it uh, contains uh, um, relevant information, especially now that we are uh, confronting uh, serious um, health challenges in, in fighting the pandemic and other issues. Okay, so friends, now that we have uh, learned about um, the issues and challenges uh, pertaining to uh, digital uh, trade integration as well as digital health, the next question perhaps on your mind is what now you know how can we move forward um, well clearly concrete steps are essential and our next presenter an ex who is an expert based in Italy will present her proposed national plan for the Philippines on digital trade integration and I had a chance to um, browse her PowerPoint and I think um, her recommendations are also relevant um, for uh, digital health our final presenter is Dr. Martina Ferracane, who is a UNS uh, consultant and a Max Weber Fellow at the U uh, European University Institute. She also consults for the uh, World Economic Forum and the World Bank. She founded and manages uh, Fab Lab uh, West in Western Sicily, a nonprofit organization that brings um, creative digital education to Sicilian schools. And she was listed in Forbes 30 under 30 for her work with Oral 3D, a startup she co-founded in the area of 3D printing and dentistry. For her work in this area, she was listed in 2018 among the 15 most influential Italian women on digital issues. Martina, the floor is now yours. Sheila. Uh, yes. And nice, nice to meet you all. Uh, thanks for the invite. And uh, I just wanted to start by thanking uh, PIDS because it's been a great pleasure to collaborate uh, and work uh, through this and thank project. Thank you for waiting for your turn. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it was great to hear uh, also to the other presentations. So um, yeah, and also wanted to thank uh, UNESCO for putting this project together. Uh, it has been uh, very interesting, and we worked through many other countries on uh, to get on top of uh, the Philippines. So 
uh, yeah, it was uh, very enriching. So let me share my uh, screen. Okay. So can, can you see the screen properly? Yes, we can. Yes. Super. Great. So, uh, well, I just wanted to come back to one of the slides, which was presented by Francis and Silwin, um, just to, 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 to start with the caveat, uh, because our whole study has been uh, uh, based, starting from the R RDTII, uh, which is an index which was created uh, to look into digital trade integration and uh, mainly focusing on digital trade restrictions. So uh, we have a lot when it comes to policies which create costs for businesses, uh, but uh, there is still not enough when it comes to uh, enabling policies and proactive policies that can uh, complement um, the, the digital trade uh, uh, investment and integration in the country. So uh, the recommendations also mainly focusing on what can be done to remove costs for businesses. Uh, but of course, there is much more uh, when it comes to com to enabling uh, people, companies uh, to to invest more in digital trade. And uh, and of course, another caveat is that uh, uh, we look into how to eliminate costs. But uh, of course, it's always up to the government to decide uh, what other policy objectives are important. So we're just saying these policies create costs for businesses, and it's uh, a given. Uh, but then there might be the willingness of governments to. Uh, give up uh, some uh, efficiency and productivity of firms because there are other policy objectives which are considered to be more important and, there, and therefore uh, deserve um, creating some costs for businesses. So eventually it's always up to, uh, to the government to, to find the, the right balance. Um, so uh, having said that, uh, let me um, present seven key areas in which we found that there are um, restrictions. Already uh, Sylvain has presented uh, uh, most of the restrictions uh, that uh, are at the base of these recommendations. Um, so one area is uh, public procurement of digital goods and services. When it comes to public procurement, most of the measures apply horizontally, but of course they also have an impact on digital services and digital products. Uh, FDI, uh, foreign direct investment, uh, Silwin has presented several restrictions in this area, um, and uh, and these of course is uh, and these restrictions that prevent businesses from investing in the country and when it comes uh, to the digital trade uh, sectors. Telecom and connectivity, the data and the telecommunication infrastructure are the bedrock of the digital economy. So it's very important that this sector is uh, as efficient as possible in order to foster digital trade integration. Data policies, uh, we found that uh, the Philippines is a very open and conducive, conducive environment when it comes to data, but we do also do found uh, found a couple of measures which can create cost uh, for businesses. Intermediate liability uh, platforms are very important for the digital economy, and we found uh, some measures which can create uncertainty uh, for platforms. Uh, so recommendations also cover this area. Digital goods, uh, we found some uh, measures which can create costs for imports of digital goods and certification uh, when it comes to standards. And finally, uh, there are some uh, enabling policies that uh, I would like to suggest, uh, which, of which apply, I would say, all over the world and which are important, uh, which, have, which go from investing in uh, digital skills uh, to connectivity. So I will uh, conclude with uh, uh, a couple of remarks on these policies. So. Uh, starting from public procurement, uh, the measures have already been uh, uh, explained and uh, presented by Silwin, so I will just focus on the recommendations. And uh, the first recommendation is to do with uh, trying to promote higher foreign participation. There are restrictions which have, which have been shown. Many of those apply at the horizontal level, and lifting those restrictions, of course, would um, promote more um, public procurement. Uh, um, also um, uh, by foreign uh, firms um, also, and also in digital uh, environment. And, uh, and this can, uh, of course, increase productivity then of, uh, of uh, the, the public procurement. There are also restrictions when it comes to foreign consultants, uh, and these restrictions uh, can prevent uh, sharing of know-how also and, uh, um, and in coming into the country. So th these restrictions uh, uh, should and uh, is advised that are lifted. Um, 
and then uh, the Philippines is not a part of the Global Agreement on Public Procurement, the WTO. The agreement uh, already covers 48 members and it might be advisable for the country to join this agreement and in particular to cover three sectors which are important for digital trade, uh, which are three um, 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 CPC sectors when we look at the list used by the WTO, which is uh, CPC 752, which is telecom, uh, uh, 754, which is telecom related services, and the 84, which is computer related services. So it is advi advisable and suggested to, to join this agreement and in particular to have uh, commitments in these three sectors. Foreign direct investment. Uh, we, uh, this is one of the areas in which we found uh, the highest level of restrictions. Uh, there are restrictions on e commerce. And, and uh, they have to do with the fact that uh, the definition of mass media, as uh, Silwin was saying, is not very clear and transparent. So it is suggested to increase transparency on the definition of mass media and uh, avoid imposing restrictions on e-commerce. There are also restrictions on advertising, which have been found, and uh, on uh, domestic uh, uh, market enterprises and also in firms that have advanced uh, technology. And uh, it is suggested to lift those restrictions whenever possible and suitable for, um, for, for the, in, in line with the policy objectives of the countries. The, also, there is a um, uh, security screening provision in the FDI uh, law. And uh, while these provisions are very common, what is suggested is that uh, um, it's, uh, uh, they are used in a transparent way and, uh, and, and they are not abused. Uh, there have been cases in which investment has been blocked by certain countries by using these provisions in a way which was very discriminatory. So it is advised to, to make sure that these uh, provisions are transparent and they are not uh, abused to block investment in the country. And uh, finally, also to connect to the next point, there are restrictions in the telecom sector, uh, as Sylvain was saying, and it is suggested to, to lift those restrictions. And uh, this complements with other uh, policies uh, for, uh, that are suggested in the telecommunication sector. And uh, they have to do with the local loophole unbundling. There is not yet uh, a law which uh, uh, imposes or requires local loop unbundling. And this can restrict competitiveness and the offer of uh, efficient services to um, the consumers. So it is suggested to, to be more proactive in uh, uh, enhancing a local loop unbundling. Also, the, strip, the, the process for licenses um, in the telecommunication sector is found to be pretty costly and restrictive, and it is suggested to streamline this process to make sure that more providers can offer services to businesses and consumers. And, of course, improve connectivity, work on infrastructure, uh, making sure that um, there is uh, more investment uh, uh, to have uh, uh, fixed and mobile uh, connectivity uh, improved for consumers. We found in our research that uh, in the past uh, uh, four or five years ago, the Philippines had some of the lowest uh, speed rates uh, when it comes to internet connectivity, internet speed uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, in the last couple of years, the situation has improved a lot, but there is still a lot that can be done in this area. Data. As I was saying, uh, in, when it comes to data, the Philippines is a pretty open environment and we didn't find any restrictions on cross-border transfer of data, which is great. Uh, I've done several studies showing that these restrictions can create costs uh, and reduce trading services. But we found a couple of measures related to data retention in the online services sector and, telecom, and for telecom providers. Uh, these data retention laws can be necessary in some circumstances when it comes to um, providing data for law enforcement, but also there are some um, judgments. For example, in the EU, we have a, judge, a very important judgment uh, called Digital uh, Rights Ireland uh, in 2014, which invalidated the European data retention law because it was found to be not proportional with the objectives that you wanted to achieve and to create uh, high concerns on freedom of expression and privacy of uh, on um, privacy of citizens. So it is suggested to review uh, these data retention requirements and make sure that they are proportional for the objectives they want to achieve and avoid create unnecessary costs uh, for businesses. Intermediaries for uh, intermediary intermediary liability. What we found is that the country does uh, have uh, some. Uh, uh, 
policies in place when it comes to uh, safe harbor for intermediaries, but these policies are pretty sectoral and very specific. And these can create, uh, can create concerns and costs uh, for businesses and uh, can reduce productivity. Uh, so it is suggested to streamline uh, the, um, the framework of safe harbor for uh, intermediaries. And also what we found is that there are some proposals uh, in, when it comes to um, uh, requirements on intermediate liability, they have to do mainly with IP. And uh, they have been criticized by some uh, civil society organizations uh, which uh, uh, work on uh, uh, freedom of expression. So it is important that if these uh, uh, proposals go uh, forth, they, uh, they are um, designed in a way that they are transparent and avoid creating restrictions on uh, freedom of expression. And uh, I will say it also later, but what is uh, important in these areas, which are very uh, technical and uh, have to do also with the, not only with trade, but also with the freedom of expression and privacy, it's very important to work with the organizations which are specialized in this area so that you can um, uh, have a full understanding of what are the implications of certain types of uh, laws, which sometimes seem very important to achieve certain objectives, but then create uh, concerns and costs uh, in other uh, areas. Digital goods, uh, what we found in our research is that uh, there is um, a dual use uh, policy, which is pretty wide and covers also computers uh, and other pr uh, products. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, this policy might restrict uh, also import of uh, digital goods, which are not necessarily uh, problematic for the security of the country. So it is suggested to revise uh, this uh, this regulation and make sure that uh, there is not unnecessary restrictions on uh, on digital goods. Also, there have been uh, we found complaints by companies and uh, business associations or when it comes to transparency of import procedures, and uh, it's important to uh, make sure that uh, this, these procedures are um, more as, as transparent as possible to avoid creating uh, additional costs uh, on import of goods. And also, we found that there are uh, some uh, additional local testing requirements and the screening of certain products, like such as telecom products and audio and uh, video products. And uh, at the international level, often uh, it's enough to have a self-declaration of conformity for importing these products and additional uh, local testing can create costs. So it is suggested when possible to avoid creating additional national tests and just rely on the international best practice on tests conducted abroad that can be reused in the country instead of duplicating uh, uh, procedures. Finally, enabling policies. Uh, these policies, as I said, are very really general and they apply to all the countries, uh, I would say all over the world. Uh, it's very important to invest in human capital and in skills. And uh, when it comes to the digital economy, it's very important to start from schools, uh, primary, primary schools. Um, as uh, Sheila was saying when introducing me, I work a lot with the uh, uh, kids in schools to promote digital education. And I think this is really the only way uh, we have to have a generation of creators and uh, users Hello, Gwen. There is a problem with the connection. Hi, hey, yes, we're back now. Yes. Okay, let me just uh, make Dr. Martin a presenter again. Oh, I think uh, Dr. Martina is not in the meeting room. Uh, let's just wait for her. Uh... I think it is safe for it if we can if we can proceed with the with the webinar because we're not sure uh, what time she's coming back. She's not yet in. Okay, I, I saw her now. Hi, Martina. Hey. We we suddenly lost connection. We don't know why. So yeah, we're back yeah. now. Y you okay. May continue. Yes. Sorry. Where 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 was I? Because I just at uh, some point it just shut down for some reasons. 
Yeah. You were in the key areas part. Okay, enabling. Okay, great. Thanks. So it's really just a few seconds. Um, Sorry. Okay. So, uh, well, was was uh, talking about uh, uh, skills in uh, in primary schools, which uh, I think should be the starting point for promoting uh, uh, digital trade integration and the digital transition in the country. Um, then support startups. There is a lot that can be done with startups, like uh, creating uh, incubators, accelerator programs, and then finance access to finance for 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 companies especially uh, venture capital funding uh, support uh, creation of companies by making it simpler and easier to create uh, startups also online and other things can be done um, in the in this area then uh, enhance dialogue with the private sector tech community and civil society uh, because as i was saying through the presentation these issues are multifaceted and they have uh, a lot of technical uh, and uh, also um, social implications in many areas. So it's important to discuss uh, with, the, with the different uh, stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder di stakeholder dialogue uh, to understand uh, all the different implications of adopting certain policies. And then uh, improve uh, data collection to make sure that uh, there is enough information available and uh, indicators available, for example, on adoption of digital solutions by uh, consumers and businesses, on import and export of digital services and, uh, and other uh, variables which are important uh, as, a, as a basis to then enact uh, new policies. And just to conclude, um, I, I always talk about fragmentation of the internet because uh, these policies uh, can end up uh, creating a fragmentation of the global internet and, uh, and create and make communication harder and harder between uh, uh, the whole world. So I think it's important uh, always to keep in mind certain uh, best practices uh, when uh, creating uh, uh, policies. Uh, one is uh, to, to try to achieve um, policy objectives that, that the government wants to achieve and that might be very important, such as national security or privacy, but always keeping in mind to avoid creating unnecessary restrictions. This is also what the WTO regulation uh, states, and uh, I think it, it's a good guide for every kind of policy that the country, uh, the countries uh, implement. Always uh, keep in mind technical and social implications of the policies which are implemented. Trying to engage in FTAs, there is a lot of next generation agreements which are being uh, negotiated. The Philippines is also negotiating an agreement with the EU and it can be a good opportunity to um, start committing on certain areas which are relevant for digital trade and might be a way to also introduce na new national policies in this area. And also the Philippines has recently uh, joined the Joint Statement Initiative and uh, this is a, a great forum um, to enhance understanding on certain areas and to shape the policies that will guide uh, probably the future multilateral uh, policies uh, when it comes to digital trade. And ultimately try to avoid fragmenting uh, the internet because this, is, uh, uh, this has implications which go well beyond uh, trade. Um, so yeah, uh, I leave you with that. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh for that uh, short yet uh, very neat uh, presentation, uh, uh, Martina. I hope you can uh, still uh, join us for the open forum. Yes? OK, thank you. Uh, we'll hear uh, from you uh, later um, uh, during the open uh, forum. So friends, uh, let us now um, uh, hear what our discussants have to say about the findings and recommendations of the two study of the two studies plus the uh, national Act action plan presented by uh martina okay we'll hear first uh from um our health department and we are honored to have with us today dr enrique tayag the chairperson of the S asean technical working group on e-health and director for at the department of health knowledge management and information technology service dr tayag has held key positions in the health department in the past 30 years, encompassing public health, epidemiology, health promotion, health systems, and universal health care. He acted, uh, he was OIC, officer in charge, assistant secretary of health from 20, 
2010 to 2015 and was spokesperson of the Department of Health from 2005 to 2015. He is known as the DOH dancing doctor because of his pension for dancing in public as he spouses unhealthy lifestyle and disease prevention. Dr. Tayag, sir, the floor is now yours. Good afternoon. Thank you for that hearty introduction, Ms. Sheila. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Eric Tayag. The slides, please. Can we go back to the title slide, please? Okay. This is paving the road to the Philippines' digital integration with the Asia Pacific in reaction to the relevance, revelations, and the road that's traveled. Next slide, please. Today, we heard several studies, including the National Action Plan, as presented by Dr. Martina Febakani, but we started with Dr. Mark Kimba's iteration on how the Philippines' readiness for digital trade integration is actually measured and the regional health integration accompanied by the assessment of the health system currently in the country today from Dr. Val Ulep. Those are valuable insights. Next, please. On your screen, we show you the rationale, the relevance, the revelation, and the road that's traveled, meaning the recommendation from these studies. Let's begin with how ready are we measuring the Philippines' readiness for digital trade integration with the Asia Pacific? Here we, the rationale was actually to strengthen our capacity to measure, monitor, and improve our performance in regional integration. The relevance is to recommend these policy interventions. The revelation is that using the Regional Digital Trade Integration Index to index which was presented, the Philippines can be described as having a slightly restrictive digital trade environment. And the road less travel. The Philippines is ready for regional digital trade integration. Next slide, please. The second study speaks of a identifying areas in which health integration and cooperation could be instrumental in improving health systems goals. The relevance is again recommending policy interventions in areas critical for regional health intervention. The revelation, we need to strengthen implementation of digital health strategies, including telemedicine, facilitate foreign direct investments, develop implement a medical tourism program, and certain cross-border mobility for the health human resource. The road less travel, pushing for regional health integration will be relevant to the country's pursuit of universal health care. Next slide, please. And the National Action Plan, the rationale is how can the Philippines succeed in implementing a conducive environment that can leverage the digital trade and thus benefit most from the value created by the digital economy. The relevance is again on policies and the revelation is that with a national strategy targeted at lifting restrictions on digital trade, the Philippines has the potential to increase its exports, especially in high value added and content intensive activities. And therefore, we'll benefit from this. The road less traveled. There must be trade negotiations at plurilateral and multilateral levels. Next slide, please. How's your health? How are you coping with the COVID-19 pandemic? It has disrupted the healthcare system in the country. And the signs are in, in the wall on the wall, at the wall, inadequate access to effective and efficient continuum of healthcare. We lost it. Long-term blind containment strategy, the lockdowns, have saddled our economy and recovery may take many years, not months. Locally-led interventions, they remain fragmented and fragile, but mostly striving 
to achieve resilience and recovery. Our hope, herd immunity through vaccination. Get vaccinated, please. Next slide. We are a connected world despite the pandemic. On your screen, we show you the different technologies that are available to us. Everybody says we are we're spending the most number of hours in internet use. Our social media is, in fact, a breath of news, including fake news. And uh, we are looking at the digital age in the country for many years to come. Next, please. But how can we make a difference? In your screen, we show you the four eyes. Let's begin with infrastructure, the insight, the interventions, and finally the impacts. Of course, when we begin to think about making a difference, we make sure that our impacts are clear to every one of us. Here in your screen, we show you that there should be engagement with the populace and that uh, patients are actually involved. But it begins with a shared vision and mission. It should be clear to all of us that we are here for the long haul. It's a journey. It's not a destination. Universal health coverage has brought us together so that we can align with the sustainable development goals and think of ways how we can accomplish the goals set for universal health coverage. Universal health coverage is not free medical care. It's making sure that affordable and quality services are available to all of us and that when we need them, where we need them, when we need them, and that it doesn't make us poorer our disease. Next slide, please. Now, let's look at the digital health divide. We've been talking about digital health or e-health. It has not gained adequate acceptance among different people and culture, even in our country, even during this pandemic. But we're looking at investments in the ICT infrastructure slowly growing. The innovation that we have built with uh, the youth inventory of applications to cover uh, health needs lead to wasted resources. The inclusivity remains elusive. That's why in the Department of Health, when we get proposals for introducing ICT solutions and applications, the first question is, will this benefit the poor? If not, then the proposals are rejected. The human resources for digital health remains unsustainable because of rapid changes in technology. There's even a scare or fear that they will be replaced by artificial intelligence. And now a growing concern is cybersecurity. That's why we appreciate the National Privacy Commission to taking the lead together with the Department of Information Communications Technology so that our personal information are safe. Next, please. Now, what's the digital health advantage? Uh, we can actually leverage digital health to accelerate our progress on sustainable development goals. Number three, that's a good health and well-being. It must support, however, many in diverse design to achieve universal health coverage. It has the potential to reduce health services, particularly with the adoption of telemedicine. Uh, Telemedicine was mentioned uh, earlier so many times. It's a game changer at this pandemic. We have launches last year. It's slowly, it's getting traction in many areas, hospitals, 
even doctors are into telemedicine and we have different platforms and we're going to unveil many models of telemedicine so that everyone will benefit. Digital health can also enhance the regulatory standards to ensure ease of doing business. And it must also offer relevant technologies that builds our capacity for remote consultation, that's telemedicine. Next, please. Now, this is a statement that we should understand there is no universal healthcare without e-health or digital health on your screen we show you the links of the health system challenges with the digital health interventions that are available and the systems that will benefit from this for example right now the electronic medical record system in the country is a hybrid one it's paper-based, there's electronic, and the e-claims of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation are actually available because of the electronic medical records system. The Department of Health has managed for nearly a decade now to make sure that the public health sector, at least 80% have functional electronic medical record systems. But many say that uh, it needs improvement. Yes, we agree that it needs improvement. But uh, right now, it's giving us very good results because we are able to monitor the performance and results of programs that the Department of Health has actually prioritized, including vaccinations, immunizations, maternal and child health, and even non-communicable diseases, include HIV, if you will. Next, please. We also say that digital health is the linchpin of linchpin of universal health care and the COVID-19 response at the same time. Uh, it recognizes that e-health or digital health is equal and integral with other healthcare delivery methods. We are now on the verge of introducing the information system strategic plan for 2022 to 2024. We are awaiting the assessment of the DICT so that the DBM can give us a green light for the huge investments we require for the next uh, three years. Uh, health information systems should be invested very well, and 3% to 5% of the total health budget is a fairly good start. Now, as to the Philippine National Health Account, uh, earlier it was said that it's only 1.5% of the total GDP, the health expenditure. The PA PSA in 2019 released that it's now 4.6 percent and we should take advantage of that next please enabling environment for digital health will also require policies and these studies have shown us that we really have to look into the context by which the studies were done the assumptions that were made the risk that we have to identify. For the Department of Health, we simplified it that we need laws. Okay, we need laws on digital health. That's uh, one holy grail we hope to achieve. If not in this Congress, the next Congress, we need this and we hope that we can uh, have our hands together so that we can move this fast. And of course, while we await the verdict of the Congress and Senate on the e-health bills we filed, uh, we have uh, attempted to make sure that there are policies issued by the Department of Health and the other agencies are partners 
to ensure the implementation of e-health or digital health related provisions of the Universal Care Health Act. Next, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have to get smart, but we should, it should not be fast. It should be step by step. And it should not be the Department of Health alone. We need you. That's why the Philippine Institute of Development Studies is a welcome partner. Okay. Can we make you our partner forever, Ms. Sheila? Dr. Celia, so that uh, the Department of Health will be guided. Okay, we can work together so that we can foster a community that is digitally helped. The digital health conventions are existing, they are growing, they are being nurtured, and that no one is left behind. I'll end with this slide. Next, please. The future is ours to build. Mga kababayan ko, may pag-asa pa po ang ating bayan. Ang mga pag-aaral na ginagawa po ng PIDS ay mahirap mang maintindihan, ay dapat maintindihan po natin. Kailangan po natin basahin pa ulit-ulit at kung hindi pa po tayo kontento sa Kanilang mga binigay na mga konteksto ngayong hapon ay kailangan pong makialam po tayo sapagkat nasa ating mga kamay ang ating kinabukasan. Wala na ba pong aasahang iba at ako po sa Department of Health ay nananatili pong committed para na sa ganon ang ating digital health platform ay maiayos po at sana po kayo ay maging kapanalig po namin at tumitingin po sa magandang kinabukasan sa ating bansa. Magandang hapon po. Maraming salamat. Maraming salamat din po sa inyo, uh, Dr. Enrique Tayag. I think the answer to your question uh, addressed to PIDS, no, if uh, the DOH can partner with PIDS forever is a resounding yes. Right, Mamsel? <laughs> Perhaps we can ask Mamsel. Mamsel, are you, you there? Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Michela. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh -oh. Mamsel, would you like to say anything to uh, uh, Dr. Tayag? <laughs> May question <laughs> sa atin eh. Yes, we welcome very much partnership with DOH. And uh, over the past few years, in fact, it has been very rewarding because um, DOH has been very responsive to um, the findings of the study. So we look forward to working with you uh, forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, My forever. Yes, a partnership forever. has just been forged. My forever pala. Maraming salamat po. Okay. Maraming salamat din po, uh, Dr. Tayag. And here is another um, agency na hopefully may forever din when it comes to collaboration, the uh, Department of Trade and Industry. So we'll have, uh, we're, we are uh, very honored to have with us today uh, to hear her comments, um, Assistant Secretary for Digital Philippines, uh, Mary Jean Pacheco, ASIC G manages DTI's e-commerce team, supply chain and logistics management division, and business name registration system. ASIC G has a significant contribution and experience in public sector management, specifically in planning, monitoring, and evaluation, performance management, public administration, and public policy formulation. ASIC G, the floor is now yours. I yeah. Thank you, Sheila, and good afternoon. And uh, thank you to PIDC president, PIDS president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for inviting uh, the Department of Trade and Industry to this webinar. Um, good afternoon also to our fellow workers in government, um, as well as the representatives uh, from the private sector. Uh, mm -hmm. My appreciation also to the authors of the studies as presented by Dr. Kimba, Sir Sil Silwin, Dr. Ulip, and uh, Dr. Martina Felacane. Um, as a gene, with all due respect, can you turn on your video so we can see you? Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, ma'am. 
Can you see me now? Not yet po. Yes, we can see you now. Go ahead, ma'am. Right. Okay. Yes. So, so as e-commerce lead, um, I would like to explain that I really found the studies to be truly an an interesting read, no? Uh, for the simple reason that the studies delved on the work that we are currently doing, no? Rel relative to the recently launched um, e-commerce Philippines 2022 roadmap. Um, I am also the department legislative liaison officer, so I am eager to report on the status of uh, specific bills in Congress. That is not only part of the DTI's legislative agenda for the 18th Congress, but these were legislative measures that respond to the policy recommendations indicated in the studies. Um, there are also um, um, other points of interest related to the DTI mandate that I'd like to touch on. Um, but but just to let, uh, I, I am quite um, mindful of the time that has been allotted to me with 15 minutes. Uh, truth to tell, I prepared, I, I, I think, about 10 points. But I, uh, due to the interest of time, I'll probably breeze through some of it, but um, focus on the major ones. Um, uh, but uh, certainly, I can, I can, I can send you um, uh, the more detailed uh, paper, uh, the more detailed uh, um, uh, uh, observations that I've had. So there, um, at the onset, of course, we are very happy to note that the study recognizes that the Philippines is generally ready for um, digital trade integration. The question of the paper: you know, how ready are we? Seems to be answered by very own messaging, no? When we launch the the e-commerce roadmap and as we pro proceed with digital transformation, and the answer is yes, we are built for this. Um, the Philippine market, no, is a huge and fast-growing, predominantly young middle-class population that uses the internet the most. Uh, we have substantially untapped and digitalized SMEs known for resiliency and creativity. Uh, we have an e-commerce roadmap uh, built on specific government roadmaps and the synergies of government agencies, or what we coined no, an all of e-government approach. Um, for example, the DICT is responsible for the national broadband plan and our digital transformation. The Banco Central ng Pilipinas no, is making headway on digital payments. The Philippine Statistical Authority on the National ID System. And thus, we're working with the IPO field, the National Privacy Commission, the Department of Tourism, field posts, the DTI Consumer Protection Group within the DTI, and all the other agencies involved in internet retail, online travel, digital media, digital financial services, ride hailing or transfer, and food. All these agencies shall continue to exercise their mandates under the law, but uh, with a shared vision no, and goal to ensure the growth of e-commerce. So uh, um, as I said, I've actually prepared uh, 10 points, but uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I, I, I mentioned some uh, and focus on others with, with, greater, with greater detail. Um, okay, the first, of course, is the e-commerce Philippines 2022 roadmap. Uh, we thank Dr. Kimba for the mention of the Philippine e-commerce roadmap 2016. Um, citing in the footnote the recently launched roadmap that we launched in January 20 this year. Um, the, the new roadmap focuses on strategies that we've simplified the framework, uh, speed, security, and structure in order to realize sales. Uh, we hope that the authors will help us uh, communicate the roadmap to as many, and we would appreciate making reference to the new and updated roadmap. Uh, we actually coined the tagline, Basta e-commerce madali, no? not only to send the message that, that e-commerce is easy um, and convenient, and that we are banking on building trust in e-commerce, but we are also guided by a different um, emphasis on madali for market access, digitalization, and logistics in the in integration. By the end of the planned period, um, we, we hope to achieve the following outcomes. Um, a million e-commerce enterprises from, from an estimated 500,000 um, in 2020. Top third of the UNTA B2C index, this measures financial inclusion, secured internet servers, number of internet users, and postal reliability. We want to increase our gross merchandise value uh, of, uh, to 16 billion from 7.5 billion, according to the Google Temasek study. Um, and uh, we shall also employ a new metric, uh, which we are calling a highly success rate, to be derived from a job outlook survey that we shall be conducting among the players in the e-commerce sector because developing a cadre of digital uh, skilled workers is one of the um, um, output, uh, outcomes of the of the e-commerce roadmap. The, sto the study noted the planned metrics uh, of the e-commerce roadmap, and, and this is something that we like to report that in 
indeed we did have we do have a, a list of metrics that we have identified in the in, in the roadmap number two let's talk about foreign investments uh, both studies mentioned the lifting um, of uh, foreign equity restrictions. Um, as I've said, as uh, the Department of Legislative Liaison Officer, the past few session days have been quite busy uh, for the DTI because we have really been uh, um, um, monitoring and uh, helping push for the enactment of these laws. These are the these three measures have been certif certified by the president are, are, and are actually on the floor even as we speak. Uh, these are the amendments to the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, amendments to the Foreign Investments Act, and amendments to the Public Service Act. Now, let me just um, uh, focus on the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, which um, was mentioned also um, as part of the recommendations. Now, the, the good news is, I'd like to inform everyone, that this has been passed in both houses. Um, and we are now in the stage called the BICAM. Um, um, the disagreeing provisions are currently being del deliberated by the bank, uh, BICAM, which was held last May. Um, uh, and the proposed amendments aim to lower the minimum paid up capital requirement from 2.5 million to $200,000 if the house version prevails or from 15 um, or to 50 million pesos equivalent to $1 million should the Senate version uh, be adopted. Um, uh, this will allow more investments up to 100% in the retail trade industry and will allow more competition in retail that will eventually produce better products in the market as a more reasonable, reasonable price. The Foreign Investments Act um, um, is another legislative measure that is a priority. This has been passed um, in the House of Representatives and uh, is currently in the period of interpolations in the Senate, if I'm not mistaken, um, probably is going on right now. In the last plen Senate plenary deliberation, the objective of opening up and liberalizing the economy for, uh, for more foreign investments um, was emphasized by, by the author, uh, Senator Aimee Marcos. Um, there is a provision in this bill, uh, in the proposed law regarding foreign um, online businesses. So this will increase the country's foreign direct investments by easing regulations to promote the entry of foreign investors in certain activities and will generate more jobs for, for, um, for Filipinos. So today is an important day because we hope that the bill will be passed uh, before the end of the regular session. And today's the last day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Okay, the third bill that is also very important and has been uh, um, um, mentioned in the in the studies would be the Public Service Act. Uh, this, in fact, amends the early, the eighty five year old law, which seeks to open doors for foreign investors and allow them to invest fully in public services. The legislative measure um, also clarifies those economic activities to be considered as a public utility and would only allow uh, 40 for forty percent ownership. Um, as you, I, I know that uh, reading through the doc, through the through both studies, there has been a lot of mention on telecommunication. Um, this is uh, the there is this is an interesting point in the in the Senate deliberation because um, we know that in the in the Senate version there is um, a mention of critical infrastructure of which telecommunication has been identified as a critical infrastructure. So what we're saying is that. Um, um, uh, this is something that is worth um, uh, ban ban bantayan po natin. It's really nice to listen to them, uh, to the debates um, uh, uh, regarding this matter. So, um, also to be now noted um, is the approval by Congress no? um, on a resolution of both houses proposing amendments to certain economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution. Um, I, I, I've, I've read uh, many, many um, uh, references to the mass media and advertising. So in the proposed Congress resolution, um, it amends Section 11 on mass media and advertising by inserting a line that says, Un unless otherwise provided by law. So if that uh, resolution is accepted by both, um, this, this is considered an amendment to the Constitution. But this is something, the policy direction of, of, of the government. So, um, um, as I said, I'm trying to limit the, the time, um, but I do have a little bit on public procurement, which I'll do later on. On telecommunications infrastructure, 
Uh, the DTI Secretary mentioned in the pre-SONA workshop, the scope of digital transformation in government digitalization is not possible without connectivity. And of course, we know that there is no e-commerce without the internet. Thus, both the legislative and executive branches of government formulated policies to address access to reliable, stable, and fast internet services. Government uh, made permitting and licensing of telco uh, towers easier. Um, uh, the EODB Act um, include provisions of on interconnectivity infrastructure development, um, where this saw the issuance um, of the Anti Red Tape Authority. Um, on the JMC on streamlined guidance on the issuance of permits for Telco Tower, which significantly shortened the processing time from eight months to just 16 days. It also reduced the documentary requirements from 86 to 35 and reduced 13 permits to eight. Um, this was further reinforced when Congress, under the Bayanihan to Recover as One Act, provided for the temporary suspension of requirements to secure permits and clearances for the construction of telecommunication and internet infrastructure and the streamlining of regulatory processes and procedures for the development and improvement of digital internet and satellite technology infrastructure. Um, just recently, um, in March this year, the president signed EO 127, expanding the provision of internet services through inclusive access to satellite service in recognition of the vital need for universal access to fast and reliable internet service. Um, I have a, a topic on, on uh, I have a, a, a comment on, on um, on the implementation of the national single window, as well the in the, in the, in the uh, on pillar number four, which is intellectual property to intellectual property rights, um, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, and thank you for recognizing the the uh, memorandum of understanding between the platforms and the brand owners, which is something that we, uh, the e-commerce office, as well as the IPO, work together. Um, to really try to encourage self-regulation uh, between the private sector. Um, while we do recognize that there is a need, that's why there, there are certain laws that are being uh, pursued. Um, uh, so so I, can, I can probably uh, discuss that um, uh, when I have the time. Now, on pillar number 10, uh, standards, this is very quickly. Uh, Sylvain mentioned about it in passing, uh, a, a bit in passing. So uh, the issue of self-certification. Self to be honest with you, I am now currently at the Bureau of Philippine Standards. Um, and I wish to report the good news that the BPS is indeed preparing a draft department administ administrative order for product registration and a self-certification scheme in addition to the existing PS licensing and ICC certification schemes, hopefully to be issued within the year. Um, okay, let's now proceed to investing in human capital and uh, digital skills. Um, as mentioned um, earlier, um, the digitalization of human capital is critical. Hence, under the the e-commerce Philippines roadmap, we have agenda action number 18 to develop a cadre of digitally skilled workers. Um, as you know, early this year, the DTI e-commerce office um, uh, embarked on a project, on a PET project. PET stands for Pivot Embrace Technology. We asked the e-commerce sector of their manpower requirements and all, and all uh, actually, uh, provided advanced digital skills, full stack developer, uh, developers, mobile app developers, programmers, data scientists, digital marketing spe specialists. Um, uh, when you are in the e-commerce work um, ecosystem, um, they, they, I realized that they have the same uh, job requirements. I choose to highlight uh, one of the complementary enabling policies in the National Action Plan because I am optimistic that the current efforts by the government addresses the weak interagency coordination um, for, as, as, um, as uh, observed in the study. Um, uh, I would I would like, uh, therefore, to report government's efforts to promote upscaling and reskilling um, because government is a uh, full court press, uh, DTI and TESTA are collaborating with Skills Future Singapore in uh, developing skills framework to guide firms, government, and workers in crafting and implementing reskilling and um, upskilling plans. Um, 
uh, TESDA undertakes skills um, needs anticipation um, uh, through its workplace skills and satisfaction survey. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, the, the TESDA, uh, the DTI, um, the DOSD, um, we, we are all uh, working on, 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 and the DICT for that, uh, I, I almost forgot the DICT, uh, but we are all uh, really uh, pushing for um, upskilling, um, especially on digital skills, because as we always say, you know, you don't need to be in IT to, to go to, to get a, a, to obtain a digital skill because all of us, all of us require upskilling uh, and all of us require digital skills. Um, I know that I am, uh, my 15 minutes is up, but I hope that I just have a few more things to say. Uh, um, there is uh, on supporting startups, one of the strategies in the e-commerce roadmap is to support funding for e-commerce innovation and technology investment. So um, uh, the, 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 with more local startups and the established businesses innovating to fill gaps in the e-commerce um, space, Funding support is needed to help innovators expand and gain more traction. The e-commerce roadmap promotes copyrights-based industries as a means to encourage innovation and increase trade of digital goods. Um, okay, uh, finally, on Pillar 10, uh, I, I will reserve uh, the last, uh, I, I rather Pillar 11. Uh, this is on the online sales and, tra and transactions. Um, the study mentioned two issues on foreign equity on retail trade, which I already mentioned earlier, and the, and the issue of uh, transport and logistics. Significant attention is given by the DTI on the, promote, the promotion of the logistics services sector, including last mile delivery services. As you know, logistics has been identified as a major part of the e-commerce ec ecosystem. Part of my portfolio in the DTI is the supervision over the supply chain and logistics management division. We are pleased to report that there is really a very dynamic public-private sector partnership. In 2018, government and logistics service providers agreed on 10 commitments, specifying areas or issues that require action to improve logistics performance. I will be pleased to discuss this in greater detail, but I am even pleased to request the help of the PIDS um, for uh, a similar partnership with the Department of uh, Health, uh, uh, because really this is an area by which we should develop uh, um, and, 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 um, and um, uh, provide more studies, because there is really a lot of information that we need in order to, to, um, to, um, to scale up and to really reduce logistics costs. Um, please note that the e-commerce office is also facilitating the ratification of the UNECC convention, the Electronic Commerce Convention mentioned in the study. We are working with agencies in the executive branch because according to the DFA, Senate ratification, this is an executive uh, agreement that requires the presidential uh, ratification. Um, my last comment pertains to the Internet Transactions Act which has been included. Thank you, Dr. Kimball. Uh, uh, you've included this, um, this uh, recommendation as a conclusionary recommendation. The proposed Internet Transactions Act aims to promote e-commerce growth and protect consumers as well as merchants. Um, the legislative measure has already been approved by the House of Five Representatives and is currently pending with the Senate Committee on Trade and Commerce and Entrepreneurship, where it is expected to soon progress. Once the RTLA has been endorsed um, uh, or has been endorsed um, or enacted into law, uh, we really hope that uh, you know through to everyone's intervention here, uh, we would all support the Internet Transactions Act because there are many provisions in the law. Uh, the online dispute resolution uh, system was um, was um, cited by the study. Uh, there is a trust mark uh, to be. Um, to be administered by the private sector. Um, uh, of course, uh, there are other specific provisions, but mind you, uh, for me, what is critical also there is the governance structure, the creation of an e-commerce bureau that we that we believe can help attain our goal. So really, there would be a, a, a focus for the support of, uh, of increasing e-commerce growth. Um, I will no longer um, comment on the on the um, on the digital health study because I would uh, of course defer that to Dr. Tayag only to say and to only recognize that um, that based on the Google Temasek study healthcare health tech as well as edtech are the new frontiers and uh, we know that this would have a significant potential in the country.
Uh, so in closing, uh, we are confident that digital trade integration will be accelerated because of increased market demand, private sector investments on telecommunications, e-commerce, uh, logistics and digital payments, and a strong push by government on infrastructure development and digital trade related policy reforms. There are going to be many more discussions, many more consultations, many more Zoom uh, webinars to make. And we thank the experts for these valuable inputs as we shall take into account the observations and recommendations in order to improve further our policies, programs, and projects, particularly in the e-commerce roadmap for uh, 2022, um, because uh, we wish to promote e-commerce, pursue digital transformation, and push for greater digital trade integration with the Asia-Pacific. As I uh, mentioned earlier, the question of the study, how ready are we, is answered by our position in, in DTI. We are we built are for this. Thank you very much. Maraming maraming salamat. Thank you very much, ASIC, uh, Mary Jean uh, Pacheco, for your um, insightful um, comments, ma'am. Uh, we are very pleased to know about the developments um, in terms of the um, uh, pieces of legislation pending in Congress, which uh, and we are excited uh, for the ratification of this, those legislations and their implementation, hopefully to move uh, our digital trade uh, forward. Okay. Friends, uh, we have only a few minutes left for the open forum, but don't worry because we will still have, um, you know, entertain um, some of your questions. So at this point, um, we will we will no longer have a poll for this week. However, we will um, um, uh, get or or uh, select two names from among our WebEx participants, and each of them will get a, a PIDS notebook as as uh, his or her prize, okay? So uh, I now invite our um, uh, speakers, all our speakers for the open forum. Uh, we have um, a question each for um, you. Okay, uh, Val, if I may um, um, address this question to you. Actually, this is from Dr. Uh, Gilbert Lianto. Um, and if I may read uh, his question, your assessment of the performance in the Philippines did not take into account the role of LGUs in health systems. Health service delivery is a devolved function. Will this matter in explaining how regional health, health integration and cooperation can help improve health outcomes? Val? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Stila, for that question. And uh, thank you for, for Sir Gilbert. Um, so number one, um, so local government, the assessment of LGU health systems are, is included in the paper, but I did not elaborate it, sorry for that. But actually one of the reasons why the Philippine health or the Philippines has a very, uh, has large variation in terms of health outcomes is, is, is because of the large variation of the capacity of local governments. To, to provide healthcare services. So, and how it will be related to, to, to uh, uh, regional integration. So if you look at the UHC law, if, if you look at the, the existing um, UHC law, one of the provisions there is to actually empower the local governments to build their local health systems. And one of that, so now with the Department of Health, if you look at, for example, if you talk to the health facilities, right now is to is, is encouraging the, the local governments to attract foreign direct investments to to actually build their, their, their own um, health infrastructure. So one of the mechanisms is attracting private sector and foreign direct investment. For example, the government, the local government of Makati is actually doing that, encouraging private sector foreign direct investments to actually augment their infrastructure gaps. And, and the Department of Health should actually make ways or uh, 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 develop a mechanisms to actually uh, capacitate local governments to do the same, right? Like a lot of local governments are not or do not have the capacity to to do that so yeah okay thank you very much for your response uh val if i may um have another question um on health again and if i may address this to uh, uh dr tayad sir um a yeah. while ago yes sir a while ago you mentioned about uh Tele, um, about uh, telemedicine, which is you, which you said is a game changer in in the pandemic. Um, okay, what uh, other 
what other silver linings can you see from this pandemic aside from 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 telemedicine? Okay, initially, Ms. Sheila, our plan to institutionalize uh, telemedicine was partly because of the <laughs> geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. Lo and behold, in the pandemic, every community is a GIDA. <laughs> Okay. wherein uh, health services were disrupted. The access was almost uh, impossible. And um, if you get a, if you do a survey, Michelle, uh, many are afraid to go to hospitals and even hospitals are suggesting to patients, do not go here. You can get infected with COVID, get your vaccination, make sure you get tested before you visit us. And so telemedicine gave us a silver lining to the, our response to the pandemic because now uh, many Filipinos and they are growing in numbers. Mm -hmm. we, but the the thing is, uh, there are there may be privacy issues. We're trying to issue guidelines, and I'm so thankful to the UP National Telehealth Center that Dr. Raymond Sarmiento is here, and to Dr. Tan because uh, we are actually working with them. We're working with different partners, with uh, telecom, with the private sector, so that uh, telemedicine um, will have a foothold and it doesn't revert back to where uh, the pre-pandemic we're in. Uh, it's uh, actually only the basic telemedicine that we have. Of course, um, the basic principle that we have is that uh, it should be inclusive and that uh, our mga uh, kababayan natin will, uh, will have that culture of change that uh, actually uh, looking for consultations doesn't mean that you have to be in the clinic, that mm -hmm. in the privacy of your home, you can trust the telemedicine providers. It may be a long way, but we have started it. It's like toothpaste, Michelle. Na pisil na hindi na pwedeng ibalik sa toothpaste tube. So, okay. arangkada na yan, Michelle. Arangkada yes. na po. Actually, my question dito, sir, from Hannah of uh, Eva Digital Clinic. She's asking if it's something that will thrive even after the crisis, this crisis, this pandemic. And I and I we heard you that okay, it's it's for the long haul this uh, uh, telemedicine? Oh, isipin nyo na lang kung meron kayong diabetes, gusto nyo bang every two weeks pupunta kayo pupunta sa clinic ka. when mm -hmm. in fact, tatawagan na lang kayo uh, pag bumalik yung traffic sa atin, may advantage na kayo sa telemedicine. Of course, may mga restrictions and limitations, but uh, telemedicine will thrive. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Tayag. Okay, let us uh, entertain um, some more questions. Um, still have a few minutes left. Um, thank you for uh, bearing with us. Okay, a uh, question here uh, from um, Director Dana Gustin of Masaganang Sakahan um, to Dr. Uh, Kimba. What are the specific policy recommendations? Uh, what are what specific policy recommendations uh, can you give to address procurement issues uh, using a whole of government approach? Perhaps after you, we can. I can also ask. We can also hear from um, Asik Jean, since this is something I think that which he reserved, uh, which he no longer tackled in his present in her presentation due to uh, time constraints. Francis, may we hear from you first? I'm sorry, I, uh, am I on mute? Uh, okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, Francis. Yes. So the I think one of the, the major issues on, on government procurement is is related to an understanding of um, supporting our industries. No? So we wanted to support our industry, so we are providing a um, uh, price uh, preference for for domestic industries but what we what we want to what but what, what we heard from the explanation of Silvin earlier is that um, 
there there is a lack of capacity that's that may be um hindering the the capability of um performance so what what we want to do is uh um to a two-pronged approach so what we want to do is first um provide opportunities to to the local industry to participate if there is a capacity but also at the same time we want to ensure that there's a a we do not um stifle the, the growth of the industry by by preventing the participation of foreign nationals so what we want to do is that we encourage partnerships we encourage um at the same not only partnerships but also at the same time some elements of technology transfer um uh, so that when uh, we are building our domestic industry but at the same time we are also learning from the the transfer of technology and, and uh, that would be the the ideal way to to grow thank you thank you very much francis uh as a g may we hear your thoughts on this i think you uh you skipped this in your presentation so here's your chance mom we cannot hear you you can't um let me hold on just a minute you okay. can't okay no, ma I, okay no, ma'am. yes ma'am okay, no, po. okay na. Yes. Okay, yes. Ah, sige, yes. So yes. I don't know. I, yeah, I'm I'm the chairman of the DTI back, no. Uh, so the the issue of procurement is is important. And just a little bit of a no, uh, uh, like a background. No, I I also used to sit before in the GPPB, and also one important uh, piece of information. Um, I used to head uh, the competitiveness bureau which issues the domestic bidder certificate. No? So this is that's why um, this uh, um, issue on public procurement is something that 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 I'm, I'm I'm quite interested in. So but of course, um, I had to sort of call friends uh, to to kind of um, ask them what they thought about this particular um, 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 provisions in the studies, no? um, parts of the study. So first of all, um, there was a, um, I, I like to relay what, what the experts, at least our, our, our government procurement experts um, um, commented on the study. First of all, um, there is a recommendation to amend Commonwealth Act 138, um, but I'd like uh, to remind that, um, that the, the domestic entity preference provision under Commonwealth Act 138 has in fact been repealed no, by, um, by the competition law. Um, we, we believe that the Filipino preference really should not be viewed as a hindrance because as you said, this is really government policy um, because uh, the policy is really to support Philippine-made products, no? um, a policy that really other countries um, as well no, have that. So other, uh, our procurement experts uh, reiterate that um, that um, if the goods really are not available in the Philippines, really um, procurement um, entities um, can can actually um, um, avail of uh, buy from foreign sources. Now, um, with the enactment no, of the Bayanihan Act, so I just want to share you a, a bit of some numbers. No? So, konti lang yung, yung the request ng certification. So, 15 uh, goods in, in 2019, uh, 56 goods um, in 2020. But you see, these are um, mga PEPs, mga protective gear. And these are all nakatulong to, di ba, sa ating mga uh, small and medium enterprises. So, so, so there, um, I think what we want to really um, uphold the fact is that um, that um, um, with the enactment, for example, the local manufacturers of an um, overgranted advantage. So, so merong ano, merong tayong uh, policy objective in that case. Um, and then we um, another comment is to also reassess the statement relative to strict to strict restrictions that apply to foreign consultants. No, um, and and a mention on the transfer of technology requirement. Um, we 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 take it to mean, naman, no, that remember that this technology transfer requirement is not something that we impose just on the on the foreign consultants. No, we also impose the very same requirement to local consultants because this is a procurement to the government, right? Um, I'd like to, for example, give you um, um, a sample where we procure the services of of Creative um, HQ, which is a New Zealand company. Um, 
uh, the, 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 it was really um, to, to be able to come up with this uh, go of tech, you know, this thing about um, 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 coming out with the, with, the, with the, um, uh, design thinking methodology to, to help come out with the central business portal, uh, the Philippine uh, data bank, um, the ease of doing business. That, that's what DTI did um, a few years back. And they were able to really come in, you know. And um, the thing is, we were really quite um, um, happy, of course, because we need, no, as a government, uh, that you know, we we can't, of course, rely on consultants, whether local or foreign. We need to learn, no. In government, um, the institution has to to be empowered, no. So in the end, um, we'd like to view it that way. That there's really no, um, uh, we, we're not saying that this is a a pampahirap, no? Uh, we should not view it as that. Otherwise, we believe that it is the the benefit that will be given to us if we do learn uh, from this um, um, technology transfers. Salamat. Thank you very much, Asik Jean. Okay, and let it let this be our last question, and this is for you, uh, uh, Martina. Actually, uh, this question came from Lloyd John, who is currently based in uh, Italy. Okay, she said, um, as an individual studying public administration, what particular policies here in Italy can you recommend uh, for the Philippines uh, to move uh, digital uh, trade, to advance uh, digital trade um, integration? Appreciate your idea, Sabinia. Martina, did you get that? Thank you. Uh, I, actually, about this, I can't say anything because i'm not studying italian uh, trade policy at all okay <laughs> so uh, i can't see much on this uh, but i also saw there was a question for me on schools so perhaps i can take the, sure, the one minute sure, to, no to respond to the other question um uh, regarding this i think it's um and i was mentioning in my presentation that when it comes to preparing our uh, young people for for the digital revolution it's very important to start from really from 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 the little ones uh, because the problem we see now in our in, in this digital transition is that we have a lot of passive consumers of digital tools and they were our our young people can really passively use a lot of social media and uh, and other tools but they are not often taught in school to use these tools to create things so what can be done is to focus on uh, uh, using certain types of technologies such as 3D printers or electronics, sensors, robotics, starting from primary school to create um, a, a, an approach which is uh, uh, proactive and creative. So try to make uh, students do stuff with technology so that they grow as a uh, as, uh, feeling empowered and, uh, and see this transformation as also something that they can shape themselves rather than uh, uh, feeling just they, they are um, responding to something which is coming from abroad. Thank you very much, sorry, Martina. I, no problem. Yeah, and no sorry problem. for the other points. It's really not uh, not my my area of expertise. It's it's, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Friends, I hate to say this, but we have to close our our open forum. And so at this point, uh, please join me in thanking our speakers, Dr. Francis Kimba, Dr. Val Ulet, uh, Mr. Selwyn Caliso, Dr. Martina Peracane, Asik Jean. Pacheco and Dr. Eric Tayag for the valuable information and insights that they have, they have shared with us this afternoon. Let us give them a big virtual clap. And thank you to all our participants who uh, uh, sent in their uh, comments and questions uh, in the open forum. So at this point, um, let us cap our event by um, by listening to the remarks of our event and project partner, UNSCAP, represented today by Dr. Jan Duval, Chief of the Trade and Facilitation Section and Officer in Charge of the Trade, Investment, and Innovation Division of UNSCAP. Um, before uh, uh, joining um, UNSCAP, Dr. Duval spearheaded the creation of the SCAP World Bank Trade Cost Database, as well as the UN Global Survey on digital and sustainable trade facilitation. Over the past 11 years, he also led the ESCAP Secretariat team supporting the United Nations Network of Experts for Paperless Trade and Transport in Asia Pacific and the negotiation of a UN treaty on the facilitation of cross-border paperless trade in Asia and the Pacific, which entered into force in 2020, 2021. Dr. Duval, the floor is now yours, sir. 
Thank you uh, very much for, for a very uh, interesting event. Uh, Dr. Reyes, PIDS colleagues, uh, senior officials, experts from the Philippines. Um, so I think it was, uh, it was very uh, interesting. I learned a lot. Uh, congratulations, uh, PIDS, for excellent collaboration uh, on the studies with ESCAP with us uh, that were presented today. So we very much look forward to continued collaboration uh, with, with PIDS and the Philippines in general as, uh, as we further step up our work in the area of digital trade regulation and integration, right, in the context of sustainable development. Uh, I think we, we all agree that digital economy and digital trade uh, are growing really rapidly. Uh, the growth was accelerated by the COVID-19 uh, crisis, but this is really a long-term trend. So that's expected to last beyond, well beyond the COVID-19 crisis. So as a result, um, the development gap between countries that have the right policy environment to engage uh, in the digital economy and those who don't uh, is likely to widen significantly. So I was very pleased to, uh, to hear uh, today from uh, Mrs. Pacheco uh, that Philippines is undertaking really a lot of revisions uh, to its legislation uh, to get things right. So as the workshop made very clear, um, enabling digital trade involves many different policy areas uh, for which many different agencies are responsible, right? including for development of hard ICT infrastructure and for regulating trade and digital services. So I certainly hope that the Regional Digital Trade Integration Index Framework right, developed by ESCAP uh, and implemented by PIDS will be useful to identify uh, priority areas for action as uh, you continue to develop a conducive environment for Philippines companies and entrepreneurs right, to engage and benefit from digital trade. So digital trade and economy regulations are still very much in development throughout the world. Uh, every region is still trying to find the best way to regulate uh, in this area and we have seen very different models emerging in the US, uh, in China and uh, in the European Union. So relatively small economies uh, with less advanced technology need to find a way to develop uh, a model that fits their need, uh, probably one that is flexible enough to engage with all, the, all of the three mega economies I just mentioned. Uh, for the Philippines, developing a flexible and open model uh, in close collaboration with other ASEAN countries is probably the best uh, way forward. So in terms of way forward on the ESCAP side related to digital trade, uh, we commit to support developing economies to effectively engage in global and regional digital economy. Uh, we are now finalizing a regional database on digital and sustainable trade integration that covers 22 countries uh, in Asia and the Pacific, so that includes the Philippines. Um, this database will be made available and maintained as a regional public good for all policymakers to use. Uh, to, to identify regulatory bottlenecks uh, and to enhance interoperability of digital trade governance uh, systems. So we are also in talk with our colleagues from UN regional commissions in Africa and in Latin America, as well as colleagues in, uh, in Europe, uh, to turn this into a global database. So we're also leading a global initiatives on uh, developing model provisions for trade in times of pandemic and crisis in collaboration with UNCTAD, WTO and others, and are about to issue a handbook for trade negotiators. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because it does include a specific chapter on digital trade provisions. That may be of interest of, of some of you. Uh, a pilot workshop will be organized in July on the basis of the new handbook, and we welcome participants from uh, the Philippines. Specifically in terms of our activities with the Philippines and PIDS on digital trade and health, uh, we look forward to finalizing both the digital trade and the digital health services study in the coming weeks. I think the digital health services study in particular will be of interest way beyond uh, uh, Philippines and to the entire region. Right? So we are actually also separately finalizing the study of the Philippines legal and technical readiness to implement cross-border paperless trade. So this is not being done with PIDS, with another group, um, but this is in connection with the entry into force of the UN Treaty on Cross-Border Paperless Trade Facilitation, of which the Philippines is a party. So findings from this study may also be very, very relevant uh, for digital trade development. So going forward, um, I would really like to encourage all of you to continue the discussions today, and I'm sure it will, um, uh, to further develop the action plan presented today. Uh, so that it can become an integral part of the Philippines government development strategy. Uh, ESCAP is certainly ready to continue to support research, analysis, and the development of appropriate policy framework in cooperation with our interested member countries. 
So on that note, uh, let me thank again all presenters and participants to the workshop and wish you uh, good health and happiness. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deval. We are very happy to collaborate with uh, UNSCAP in the research studies on digital uh, trade and digital health presented today, as well as in this knowledge sharing um, activity to disseminate the results and recommendations of those studies. And we look forward to more joint activities between PIDS and UNSCAP. Okay, friends, um, at this point, before we uh, finally close, allow me to um, um, to announce the, the winners of uh, our poll uh, for today. Not our poll, but um, yeah, the, the, the draw that uh, we had um, today. Uh, Mary Jean uh, Colleen, uh, Mary Colleen Cass and Remus uh, Romano Reyes. Mary Colleen Cass and Remus Romano Reyes, you won. Um, in our um, uh, in our uh, um, webinar today, and our webinar team will get in touch with you for your prize. Okay. So, and finally, we have some reminders before we close. Um, okay. Um, you may download. Uh, you may get copies of the presentations from the PIDS website and flash on the screen is the link. Um, to the to the full studies and uh, shortly we will be posting as well the the links to the presentations. Okay, um, and help us improve our web webinars by answering our survey. We uh, really appreciate your comments and suggestions so we can serve you better. Okay, and um, always follow our social media pages. Uh, thank you. Thanks to all who are uh, have tuned tune uh, with us um, in our um, Twitter page for the highlights of our event. Also, um, our Facebook followers. And thank you for always uh, visiting the PIDS website. And here's our the rest of our webinars for this month. Next week, we will have our webinar on examining Philippine regulatory policies and solid waste management on the 17th. Um, webinar on um, agrarian reform. We'll talk about uh, how to improve land tenure security farmers and the role of agrarian reform beneficiaries organizations in enhancing agricultural productivity on the 23rd. Okay, this is a um, um, the conference, the uh, annual conference uh, hosted by the uh, Philippine Apex Study Center Network uh, headed by Dr. Kimba. We'll have um, the uh, uh, annual conference on navigating the new normals, restarting and rebuilding global MSMEs. And finally, on June 24, very interesting topic, senior high school graduates, prospects and challenges in the labor market. Okay, so watch out for the registration links to those events in our uh, Facebook page. And finally, we'd like to thank all the representatives from the government sector, from uh, the private sector, um, civil society, academe, and also um, in the media for um, um, joining in our webinar today. We hope to see you again in our future virtual events here, here in PIDS. And friends, this concludes our webinar for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Maraming salamat. And again, thank you to our speakers. Bye-bye. It's fine.